Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Fantasy Fangirls Podcast, where two sisters dive deep into beloved fantasy lore, characters, themes, theories, and more. I'm Lexi. And I'm Nicole. And on today's Akawar episode 10, we are so excited to cover chapters 69 through 74 of A Court of Wings and Ruin by Sarah J. Maas. As always, let's kick it off with our content warnings. While we're focusing today's discussion on this stretch of chapters and Akawar, these episodes do include spoilers for the entire Akatar series. These deep dives do not, however, have spoilers for the rest of Sarah J. Maas' series, except at the end of every episode, where we have our Maas first Maas Madness segment. We'll give a big spoiler warning so you can leave the episode if you haven't read the mass verse, or you can keep listening for Crescent City callouts. At least that's what it is today. So with all of that said, if you don't know that King of Spices Papa Archeron is about to come in a Wall Nation sales song style, then please go finish the series. We will be here when you're done. Next, we of Fantasy Fangirls are adults who say adult things about adult books. In other words, friends, this podcast is rated R. Death, deception, goodbyes. Is that rated R enough for you? Probably not, but trust us, we will make it rated R. So please do be mindful of those little listening ears. Additionally, we are so excited to see you at upcoming live events. We cannot wait for the Fantasy Fangirls live show at Comedy Works South in Denver, Colorado this October 20th. We finally announced our topic. It is going to be our biggest questions going into Onyx Storm. There will probably be some sisterly bets made on stage. I'm so excited. I'm already planning what I'm going to do if Lexi loses. I can't wait. Oh, no. (laughs) It's okay. I'm like literally like this week, I'm cashing in on one of our bets from last year with babysitting. (laughs) I'm excited to hang out with those littles. But for this event, VIP tickets are already sold out. However, you can still grab those general admission tickets with the link in the show notes. We'll also be influencer partners at the Swords and Shadows Masquerade by Mountains and Magic in Highlands Ranch, Colorado on November 23rd. You can also dance the night away with us at the Fantastique Collection's New Year's Eve drop party in Denver, Colorado. And we have so much in store as podcast partners at Romanacy Book Con in Los Angeles on February 20th through 22nd in 2025. Links to all of these plus more information and tickets are in the show notes. So go ahead and check them out. And lastly, if you love fantasy fangirls and have been loving this Akatar series journey we're on together, if you want more content, more community, more events, and just more all around, please check out our Patreon. We have three membership tiers that you can join. Number one, the Valkyries, which includes access to our bop and discord, live Q and A's from Lexi and I, community events, a book club, promo codes for live events, plus 20% off discounted and exclusive merch, all for $5 a month. Or you can join the High Fae, which includes everything from the Valkyrie level, plus early access to ad-free episodes, our full episode outlines, and special voting privileges. That's for $10 a month. And last but not least, we have our newest and highly requested tier, the Inner Circle, which includes everything from the other two tiers, plus behind-the-scenes content from Lexi and I, a welcome gift, giveaways, private Discord channel, name shouted out on the podcast, and that is all for $25 a month. Feel free to join the party at patreon.com slash fantasy fangirls. The link is also, of course, in the show notes. And really and truly, thank you so much from the bottom of our hearts for supporting us as we've turned this podcast into our livelihood. It's literally all because of you. And now it is time to commit murder on the King of Highburn. Is it murder if he really needed to die? (laughs) (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Just asking. (laughs) Well, everyone, it is an action-packed battle episode. And as always, Nicole is going to start our episode by summarizing what happens in Act War Chapter 69. <laughs> you can't ever say that without giggling. <laughs> chapter 69 through 74. So gather round, friends. We need an inner circle debrief. Chapter 69. Nice. In the human <laughs> lands, it's time for a pre-battle inner circle debrief, beginning with Asriel, who is not able to fight today because of his injuries. So he gives Elaine his emotional support dagger. Stick him with the pointy end, Elaine. That's what she said to Asriel last night. Knowing that this very well could be the last time they are all together, Reese begins his Oprah-level motivational pep talk, which will 
probably bring me to tears in a couple minutes. But enough of those pesky feelings. It's battle time with the plan in motion of go fight win <laughs> kind of <laughs> Co- a for effort <laughs> Faber and co are to go to the cauldron and using the spell from the book of breathings further known as bob to destroy hybern's army at least that is the plan according to amran first up though in prithian battles magic and monsters of which Feyre and reese are basically pokemon trainers i choose you Braxis, bone carver and weaver very sweet mating presents to each other. Y'all could have just gotten gift cards, but that works too. Chapter 70. The monsters kill their way across the Highburn host, but it's not enough. So Reese, channeling his inner bath and body works, misses a massive chunk of Highburn's army, but it's still not enough. So who comes in? But Man Bear Pig, Autumn Court, and the human army led by Jurian featuring Douche Canoe Supreme, Grayson, immediately destroying the hybrid caches of Feybe. Nice job, guys. With that massive distraction, it's time to rally the Archerons and go to the cauldron. But oh no, the Nesta life alert alarm is going off. She screams for Cassian to come off the battlefield just in time for him to get out of range before a thousand Illyrian warriors and the bone carver die from the cauldron's metaphorical pew pew. Rest in peace, you creepy child. Chapter 71, all is lost. It's time for plan B. Small problem. There's not a plan B. So it's time to wing it. (laughs) Haha, get it? Sending Cassian and Asriel out to defend two parts of the legions and essentially sending them to their deaths. It's time for the official goodbyes. But wait, what's that? It's a huge armada and winged army and they're headed their way. But wait a second. They're on our side. It's Draken, Miriam, Lucian, and Vasa. We're saved. We're saved. But it's not only Draken coming in daddy o ex machina style. It's none other than Spice and Gem Trader, plus the creator of Spice Watch himself, Papa Archeron, doing something useful. Finally, chapter 72, new change of plans. Feyre and Amran will go to the cauldron to perform the destroy Highburn Bob spell. Nesta and Cassian will lure the king of Highburn away from the cauldron in a distraction that will absolutely surely not kill them. What could go wrong? Chapter 73, Feyre and Amran making their way downtown, walking fast, Striga past it, and they're cauldron bound. However, it's not all catchy 2000 piano pops because Striga faces off with the king of Highburn and this super feared top of the food chain in the middle absolutely destroys this fake king who was 100% inferior to her. Oh, no, he snaps her neck and she's dead. Seems illogical, but moving on. Amon and Feyre make it to the cauldron and Feyre puts her hands on this giant cookware, locking herself to it just in time for Amon to toss Bob away because it turns out Bob was just a ruse. Chapter 74. Feyre has no time to give this tiny ancient one a talking to because her mind is cast across the battlefield as she logs into the Zoom meeting from hell with Cassian and Nesta with the King of Highburn holding a sword to the Spice Master Supreme's neck. Papa Archeron, no! Begging for Daddy-O's life, Nestus, please go unanswered. And the King of Highburn continues his streak of giving the worst neck massages ever and kills Papa Archeron. R.I.P. Prince of Merchants. You had 45 seconds of being useful. Congratulations. Cassian throws himself at the King of Highburn and gets quite the boo-boo. It looks like Elaine's that so raven moment showing Cassian's death is coming true. The two never got to be lovebirds lock in a Shakespearean level goodbye and they're about to die. But what's this? Coming in Arya Stark style, a late motherfucking Archeron uses the pointy end of Truth Teller into the King of Highburn's neck with a don't you touch my sister. Huzzah! 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 Plus a few pages into chapter 75 because we need to finish the scene. Nessa takes Truth Teller in the king's neck and goes to town on beheading him, ensuring his death. She holds up his head like a trophy and the cauldron and Feyre zoom, zoom, zoom back to the hilltop where they physically are. We all may be holding on to this last little bit of summer, but oh my goodness, can it do a number on my hair. If you didn't know, it is dry and hot here in Colorado, which makes my hair feel brittle and dull without that moisture in the air. The fact is, even if we're not aware of environmental changes in our day-to-day, our hair sure is. That's where pros comes in to save the day and my hair. 
Pros makes beauty personal with truly custom formulas that couldn't exist without you. Each and every single bottle is made to order based on an in-depth consultation that covers everything from your beauty goals to the weather and water where you live. From millions of possible formulas, only one is uniquely yours. And Pros uses only natural, powerful, and proven effective ingredients, selecting from over 185 clean ingredients to target your specific concerns and goals. Since I switched to pros, I've noticed that my hair is shinier and softer. It's easier to style and still looks good even when I don't have the time to style it. Pros gives my hair new life and it just feels healthier all around. Pros is so confident that you'll love your results that they're offering our listeners an exclusive trial offer. 50 percent off your first hair care subscription order at pros.com slash fantasy fangirls. That's P-R-O-S-E dot com slash fantasy fangirls for your free consultation and 50% off your custom routine. Pros.com slash fantasy fangirls. It's time to step into the cauldron and discuss key insights, character analysis, lore, foreshadowing, theories, and oh, so much more. Before things get too chaotic, let's set the stage for this final showdown, the big battle that this whole book has been leading up to. And remember, friends, when we deep dive these battle sequences, Nicole and I really do go beat by beat because it's always a little crazy on the pages. So we're here to walk through exactly how the battle plays out so we all understand what happens amid the chaos. Last night, everyone who was able to winnowed as many humans as they could out of Highburn's march across the human lands toward the eastern coast. Now these humans winnowed away are in Adriata with Crusada. Good thing too, because Highburn has demolished everything in its path, including the Artron's village and estate. Good thing our friends evacuated the humans to Adriata out of last night. They evacuated everything except for the Archeron livestock. They did evacuate the horses and the dogs, which I really appreciate that little inclusion because that I was going to say those are the heart. animals that I care most. About. <laughs> <laughs> like I love animals, but like I am a horse Donkey. and dog girl right there. <laughs> First off, I didn't realize they had livestock. That was like kind of a oh, but like poor cows, poor llamas. Who knows what they had? I love a llama. I'm so sad if it died. Probably add, it kicked her. It kicked her, sir. One of the, one of the adders. Probably had goats. Goats are mean, though. <laughs> I've had a goat before and it was mean. You had it. When did you have a goat? At Molly's oh, like, okay. on the ranch. Yeah. And once they escaped and it took like five hours to catch them. <laughs> Anyway, Feyre recognizes what Hybern destroyed as a personal attack on her and her sisters because ruining and looting their old house will really stick it to them, right? Now it's dawn and the Perithian army is marching in Hybern's wake here in the mortal lands. They know that Hybern will have the big advantage of picking the battleground for all of them to face, but there's not much that they can do about it. This Perithian army is made up of five courts, including summer, winter, dawn, day, and of course, night. They haven't heard anything from spring or autumn, so they aren't counting on them this late in the game. Asriel's wings have thankfully healed, though he still isn't strong enough to fly today, much to Az's protest. Unsurprisingly, he insists on flying and fighting with the legions. It isn't until Moore begs him that he agrees not to fight and only be the eyes and ears during this battle. Although I will say this agreement won't last long. Our crew prepares for battle as they head toward the eastern coast where Hybern has selected the battlefield. Remember the plan. When the fighting is at its peak and the king is distracted, the Archeron sisters and Amran will go to the cauldron and cast the supposed spell to bind the king and his army, therefore wiping them off the face of this earth. The rest of the Prithian forces and the High Lords will do everything in their power to buy them the time they need to eliminate the enemy at the right moment. It's time for Fit Watch. While Feyre and Nesta are both in Illyrian leathers, Elaine, taking one look at the legs and the assets on display, was like, um, please, no, please, no. <laughs> I guess that she wouldn't like our athleisure, you know, fashion trends right now. <laughs> like, all I do is live in leggings. I was going to say, I'm literally wearing <laughs> skin tight leggings right now. <laughs> so, yes. So instead, Elaine gets some winter court battle fashion that is much less scandalous. It is leather pants with a thigh length blue overcoat and a white fur trimmed collar. Honestly, I love that this is just another show don't tell moment that Elaine doesn't belong in the night court. And I don't mean that as a dig. I mean that as like she's just 
like every time she's mentioned in black, it's like, oh, God, why are you wearing black? This is wrong. You know where she does belong with good fashion? Where? Toga, toga, toga. toga. <laughs> Day court. <laughs> Cassian insists on giving Nesta a blade, even if she is untrained. Our dear bat boy isn't going to let his future mate be unarmed as they go up against the enemy, especially since he won't be there to protect her because, of course, he'll be leaving the Illyrians. While Elaine refuses the knife Cassian offers her, she does accept Truth Teller when Azriel offers to let her borrow it. Record scratch, everybody. He has never let another person touch his obsidian hilted dagger, let alone use it. I will only be calling Truth Teller the emotional support dagger. That is what it is known in my head canon. <laughs> I know, me too. And yet here he is wanting Elaine to use it today since he won't be fighting. He wants to offer her as much protection as he can, much like why Cassian is insisting that Nesta take a knife. He also trusts Elaine to borrow it in good faith, and he understands her deeply where she might refuse Cassian's knife, but she doesn't refuse this subtly grand gesture. Elaine recognizes the importance of this dagger to Azriel, and she is honored that he entrusts her with it. I love that moment where Elaine is like, I don't know how to use it. Damn, she's a fast learner. I, that's all I can say. Wow. Really went from zero to 60 in 3.5, my girl. I also love how a painting of the two of them appears in Feyre's mind. Quote, light and dark, the space between their bodies, a blend of the two, the only bridge of connection, that knife. I also have a theory about why Elaine is more inclined to take and later use Truth Teller. And to share this theory, I'm going to give the quick disclaimer that I am pulling a tiny bit of information only about Truth Teller that we learn outside of the Akatar series. Truth Teller was among the last cauldron made objects formed of otherworldly material created to fight against the Daglin and it also unmakes things. Who else was made by the cauldron? Elaine. So I wonder if she feels a pull toward this dagger because after all, like calls to like. And she feels a sense of, I'll call it comfort in it that she would never feel with another weapon. Perhaps Truth Teller even helps her, I'll call it muster the courage to kill the King of Highburn. Although first and foremost, I really do think Elaine takes it upon herself to change the future she saw of Cassian dying, but we'll get to that soon enough. More on Truth Teller in today's Mass vs. Madness. Like we discussed in last episode, going into this battle, they have little hope that they will make it out alive. That is, if the Archeron sisters do not make it to the cauldron with Amran, because yes, that is literally their only plan and hope. So with that weighing on their minds, Reese begins his vulnerable speech to the group. This is less of a goodbye speech and more highlighting the strength that each person brings to the war effort and what they mean to this little family. Reese says, quote, I believe everything happens for a reason, whether it is decided by the mother or the cauldron or some tapestry of fate. I don't know. I don't really care, but I am grateful for it, whatever it is. Grateful that it brought you all into my life. Oh, bu 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 bu. He goes into each person individually, which I will attempt to do without bursting into tears, starting with Cassian. Reese brings up how Cassian is the truest form of, quote, strength, resilience, honor, and loyalty. I truly cannot think of any better four words to describe Cassian. Like, what a Gryffindor sentence that is right there. I love it. Then to Asriel. Reese says that Asriel taught him that it is the family you make, not the one you're born into, that matters. And because he met him, he knows what true hope is even when the world tells you otherwise. This is quietly one of my favorite goodbye, not goodbyes in this moment. Because not going to lie, Azrael is not someone I outright associate with like hope because of how dark and quiet he is. But when I read this, and especially when I think about it in tandem with like the Nephilim philosophy and all that kind of stuff, it makes a lot of sense. Again, it's just another reason why I'm so excited for his POV book. I want to be in his head more to really see this optimistic side of him, I guess is the right word. Well, it, exactly. So like Azriel found hope in the darkness, companionship in the shadows, literally. And against the odds, he learned to fight. He learned to fly with the help of his chosen family who bolstered his sense of hope. It's such a double meaning too, even though Reese isn't referring to it here, but Azriel has been in love with more for 500 years, hopeful when it's insinuated time and time again to give up. And he's going to take his hope against the odds and apply it to another love interest soon enough. 
again, I know that Reese is not talking about that, but as a reader, we know the double meaning. <laughs> During the goodbye, he's like, let me tell you about all the women you can't have, <laughs> but you really want. <laughs> Speaking of women he wants but can't have, then Reese turns to Moore, who was already crying, saying that because he got to know her, he learned what it means to have light even in the darkest of hells. Quote, that kindness can thrive even amongst cruelty. It's just such a beautiful callback to Moore's moment in Akamath of don't let the hard days win. And it's a reminder that you can still be living in darkness and still look to the light. Then we have Amran. After calling her a fire drake, which is how he described Amran to Feyre way back at the beginning of Akamath, Rhys brings up how it is thanks to her that his power is what it is and is as controlled as it is. And if it wasn't for her, it would have consumed him wholly. I do wonder, like, what were their early days of getting to know each other? Because we know that she was something to his dad, whether that like, uh, I'm not saying that. <laughs> Do I need to pull out my no. theory card? <laughs> no, I think I have put the theory to bed that his dad and Amron were having an affair. I think I put that to bed. But I do think that she was some kind of advisor or whatever to his dad. And yes. I would imagine that Reese, you know, being primed to be high Lord would have it, it's some kind of connection with her. But what I would give for those early days of them getting to know each other like how did she how did he get on her good side that's my question i also can only just imagine her dealing with a 20 30 <laughs> something year old bat boy where it's just like oh my god well she was she also because reese and cassian and asriel were all such a unit they were so close she probably got to know them maybe not immediately because you know maybe like they were in council meetings or whatever together with like just reese and amarin but she probably got to know the bat boys all three as a unit and was like oh my god <laughs> Like what I would give for that. Anyway, I love how there's so much between the lines in this goodbye, not goodbye, because there's this years of training montages that you can almost hear within these lines. And yeah. what I would give for a short story of all the training sections with Reese and Amran. Only Amran can truly comprehend what Reese goes through day in and day out with this much power. It's isolating to be so different from those around you. And these two have found solace in each other. And she took him under her metaphorical wing. I'm going to skip over what he says to Feyre for just a moment to highlight what he says to Elaine and Nesta. While they're not fully to the level of family in the same sense that the rest of the inner circle is, I love that Reese still acknowledges them here. He says, quote, we have not known each other for long, but I have to believe that you were brought here into our family for a reason too. And maybe today we'll find out why. Why? Yes, you will, good sir, because they will be the ones to kill the King of Highburn. It's such a testament to the theme of fate in the series. Careful, everyone. Lexi's getting feral into the microphone. <laughs> when she talks about fate. I love it. And of course, last but not least, let's discuss his goodbye to his mate, Feyre, which only, oh man, it's only when he addresses his mate does Reese get teary eyed and words start to escape him. So he says down the bond, quote, I would have waited 500 more years for you, a thousand years. And if this was all the time we were allowed to have, the wait was worth it. Oh, <laughs> romance, swoon, crying. I'm not okay. It was so cute. <laughs> It shows that sometimes more words aren't needed. It says everything that he feels in his heart, representative of their soul deep love and connection, how she has made him feel alive and loved in a way that he never felt before. And that favorite completes him. And he is simply grateful to experience whatever amount of life he can with her in this completion together. So together as one family, all of them link hands and stand together in their tight little circle, which I need to pause real quick and ruin this moment because at my wedding, we did, it was like a super small wedding. It was like only 35 people. We, the DJ had us do almost like a rendition of this where they all, like he had us all like stand in a circle holding hands. And I was holding hands with Lexi and she was with Jake on her side. And then Brett was on my other side. And I <laughs> look over at Jake and he says, it's like we're the who's in Whoville to which Brett leans over and says, Whovalation, Whovalation. <laughs> <laughs> that right there says everything about her husband. <laughs> Still one of my favorite moments. From my, like it was such like a heartfelt moment. And it was like one of my favorite moments. The boys just had to go. And, yep. Yep. 
my God. Anyway, as Reese closes out his speech, saying that today they will find out if it's meant to be their time to continue living or to go to the far off kingdom of milk and honey. And he says, quote, the great joy and honor of my life has been to know you, to call you my family. And I am grateful more than I can possibly say that I was given this time with all of you. Oh, and then it's Amarin, who is not known in the crew for being emotionally vulnerable, let's say, who says that we are grateful we sand more than you know. Which just speaks volumes, especially considering the speech she gives right before she will go into the cauldron. But, you know, that's next episode. I can't wait. As we enter the closing of this trilogy, I'm going to call it at least a trilogy in Feyre and Reese's story is how I'm looking at this. This is so poignant of how we as readers are feeling. Many of us who read these books for the first time are altered in some way, whether it was igniting a love for reading again, seeing a new side of themselves reflected in these characters, or even having quite literally an out-of-body experience visiting Valaris in our minds. But because of the journeys that we went on with these characters, this is also a moment of us saying how grateful we are to them too. And I can't not say it, because we knew them, we have been changed for good. <laughs> I love this scene so much as it reflects the caring and loving leader that Reese is at his core. And like Nicole was saying, it gives us readers a sense of closure with these characters as the trilogy ends. I'll be honest, after I read this for the first time, I was 100% convinced not everybody in the circle was going to survive. It's too beautiful of a goodbye for them to all make it out alive. I have a lot more feelings on this matter, but I'll save that for next episode and simply enjoy this beautiful moment we readers share with these characters we have come to know, love, and appreciate. All right, it's time for the final showdown, friends. Highburn has chosen the battlefield location, and it's a vast, grassy plain that stretches to the sea with rocky foothills. Remember, we're at the humans' realm's eastern coast. Highburn's gigantic army is a mile inland, and it is a dark mass that just stretches as far as the eye can see. Some of his forces are stationed on top of these rocky foothills, giving Hybern a major higher ground advantage. This is also where the cauldron is situated, so it is well placed for targeting the battlefield below, as our crew will unfortunately learn. The Perithian army made up of the five courts gets into position, including the winged legions forming their lines in the sky. All the while, Hybern's host eerily waits in stillness, ready for the fighting to begin. If we haven't mentioned it, our friends are vastly outnumbered. Have I mentioned that yet? I don't think so. Let me say it one more time. They are vastly outnumbered. They might have five high lords against one powerful king, but our crew hasn't seen the full extent of his power yet. Plus, the king is wielding the almighty cauldron, and he'll have shields that our friends have to use their precious energy on getting through, draining their magic before they can even hit the enemy. Oh, and the king will also have lots of spells. Basically, the Prithian side is fucked. Cassian calculates that worst case scenario, the battle will last a few hours before they lose. Really puts the pressure on Amran and the Archeron sisters to get across the battlefield, find the cauldron, and use the supposed spell to obliterate Hybern's forces. It is apparently customary in these kind of battles for magic first before the actual fighting, where both sides try to bring each other's shields down with their power. So all the High Lords unleash their magic except for Reese, who is saving his power for after the shields go down. As all this magic on both sides make the shields falter, some soldiers die, but not many, and the grass between the armies turns to ash. I love that little detail. Yeah. Again, just like demonstrating the details of how this magic impacts the land. What else comes with magic, though? Surprise monsters. Finally, Highburn is one step behind our crew. <laughs> <laughs> Feyre starts telling Reese about the mating present that she got him, which is really amazing mating present for both of them. I love how she's bringing this up of like, I got you a present as he is gathering up all of this power for misting, right? It's almost like she's wanting to keep a part of him tethered to who he truly is so that he doesn't get lost to the chasm of his power that he has. But because it's kind of like it, honey, I'm kind of busy right now. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out she's been using her own magic for hours with a glamour hiding these monsters. As soon as hybrid shields go down from the magic, Feyre lets the these mating presents loose. I thought she was drained of magic. I guess she wasn't because she does need enough to go to the cauldron. But 
for two people who are very drained of magic, they're doing the most right now. It's kind of impressive. Well, when we say drained of magic, I think it's more of an exhausted from doing all the winnowing back yeah. and forth. But they've had a little bit of time, a few hours to replenish it, I suppose. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But now, first up, we have Bryaxis, who Feyre freed after Amran took down the wards in the library. At least we assume Amran helped take down the wards after Feyre visited the bone carver with the Ouroboros. Since Amran is the only one supposed to be able to take down the wards, and she mentioned at some point that she'd been working on taking down the wards for a while there, Feyre had recently been waiting for Amran to help her free Bryaxis. So I don't know how that actually all played out. Like, I even wonder if Feyre ended up being able to free Braxis from the warded library on her own, now able to after claiming the mirror? That sure. Yes, that's what oh. I'm going to go with that. <laughs> that sounds great. On this battlefield, Bryaxis is a cloud of darkness and writhing and whirling in on itself. However, Feyre later notices that its ever-changing blur has moved into claws, fangs, wings, and muscle. What is muscle? What does muscle look like in shadow form? <laughs> that's that's a head scratcher. <laughs> like every now and then. <laughs> it just makes, grrr, it makes that noise across the battlefield. However, wherever it goes on the battlefield, blood sprays as it crosses the highburn soldiers. Some die just from pure terror alone. Yikes! Then, of course, we have the Bone Carver, who Feyre freed by putting him in a fey body to get him out of the prison just like Amran did for her own escape. The Bone Carver is in an Illyrian soldier form and looks to be a warrior in his prime. He's also holding a scimitar of bone that he sweeps before himself. Soldiers just drop dead without even the blow touching them. I love that, that the power is just so intense from it. Now, I have a theory. I wonder if he chose the Illyrian form and I wonder if it's actually still tied to Nyx because Nyx is obviously a quarter Lyr Illyrian. Illy no, yes. well, tech, yeah, a quarter Illyrian. No. Well, no, because Favor was technically three, three qu quarters. That's technically. so confusing. Okay, so he's <laughs> technically three quarters Illyrian, but also a quarter Illyrian. So maybe we'll just, he's half Illyrian. <laughs> we'll just leave it there. So he's part Illyrian and... I do wonder if having, you know, Cassian as his uncle, I do wonder having Reese as his father, if he is going to grow up to be an Illyrian soldier. And if this is like almost a grown up version of Nyx that the Bone Carver is being on the battlefield. I see what you're saying. I take it more as the Bone Carver st starting in an Illyrian warrior form because he respects these warriors. They're unparalleled fighters, strong and courageous. And when he gets to choose what form he wants to be, that's the kind of warrior he wants to be heading into the battle. So I hear what you're saying about Nyx. And, and separately, I do think that he will be an Illyrian warrior in his own right. But in this case here, I think that it is solely the symbolism of what an Illyrian warrior stands for. Because he maybe he even gets a little bit of inspiration from Cassian, who put some of the monsters in the prison. So there's like a lot of whispers about him between the walls. And maybe that's where, you know, the bone carver is like, I want to be like Cassian kind of thing. There's also, we can't forget, the concept of death with the bone carver. Does he take the form of an Illyrian warrior because so many of them die in this battle? So it's like he's like drawn to that form or something of that nature. This doesn't fit as much with taking this actual fairy form to escape the prison versus the unique forms he is to each person in his otherworldly state. So that's why I really do think it goes back to he finally got to choose what form he wanted to be. And he chose a form of somebody who symbolizes that real courageous and strength and such. But anyway, Feyre has a double bargain with Bryaxis and the Bone Carver. And of course, we are introduced to her infamous back tattoo from her base to her nape with the four phases of the moon and a small star in the middle of them. This bargain bond is how she silently communicates with the two monsters, ensuring they do her bidding and only go after the hybrid soldiers. For right now, we're going to ignore that Feyre actually already made the second bargain with Bryaxis back in the library and has a second band on her forearm from it. This will come into play later, I think. This 
reminds me, this tattoo reminds me of how Reese would almost spy slash communicate with Feyre down the bond of her first tattoo yes. that she had. Oh, that's such a cool callback. But the surprises are not done. With a wink, Reese points to where the bone carver and Bryaxis are demolishing the battlefield. And Vanna White style, another figure appears, Striga, aka the Weaver. Striga appears just as we have known her, except for one addition, a pale blue jewel on the top of her head. This is Ianthe's jewel. Freaking iconic. I love this. It is so unbrand for a creature that hoards others' possessions to just display this as like a major fuck you. I love it so much. Now, how did Reese get the Weaver to, you know, agree to the surprise, you ask? He sent Helion out to bargain on behalf of himself, which is why Helion found Feyre that day when the Surreal died in the middle. The Weaver's job on the battlefield, other than just, you know, killing like crazy, is to find the cauldron so that Feyre and Co. will know where to go when it's time. How does the Weaver know how to find the cauldron, Feyre says, quote, because she appears to have an unnaturally good sense of smell. While Feyre is not wrong, I mean, this is a nice little callback to when she was in just recently in Striga's cottage and Striga was like, I smell my brother. I smell that you have stolen from me, all that kind of stuff. Yes, Feyre is not wrong, but I do wonder if this is also an unreliable narrator moment or if this is entirely accurate because she could also be familiar with the cauldron if she is Daglin. Since Daglin are very familiar with the cauldron, they made some of the items of the Dread Trove. I do wonder if she has this like sixth sense connection to the cauldron for that reason. I thought we agreed that they weren't Daglin. I'm opening it up again. (laughs) And it's not the last time I'll be doing it on this episode. (laughs) But I do have a question for Reese here. Because in exchange for the Weaver's help on the battlefield, the deal was that he was going to break the Weaver's containment spell on just being in the middle. Let's just say that the Weaver does survive today. That would be really bad. Like That's terrifying. I like to think there was more to the bargain. And this is totally just my headcanon where it's like, and you will respect the court territory borders or something to that effect. Because, yeah, otherwise she would be a little bit of a scary issue for Prithian <laughs> after they win this war. Yeah. <laughs> Now, I do wonder if the bone carver also on the battlefield was a bit like, fuck you guys. I told you the reason why I didn't want to go out into the world was because of my siblings and just appearing on the battlefield is none other than his sibling. Luckily, uh, he starts to kind of back away slowly, but luckily it ends up working out really well because the bone carver, while he's slowly retreating, the weaver like gives him a mocking bow, which is like such a sister moment. I love that, which I guess was their momentary truce on the battlefield. Much like Reese says, here's to family reunions. (laughs) It, It is. It's such an adorable moment between death God twins. You know, nothing brings a family together like killing the bad guys. Good to know. (laughs) But (laughs) what do these monsters mean for the war? A lot of help. Honestly, that's what it means. Quote, bodies fell before them. Bodies were left in their wake. Some mere husks encased in armor, drained by the carver and striga. Some fled from what they beheld in Bryaxis, the face of their deepest fears. These monsters are here to do what an army of soldiers would not be able to do and that is kill really really quickly and make people retreat really quickly you know lexi i have an idea that would have helped elaine feel a lot more like she didn't need to wear winter court battle gear in summer and that idea is quince quince is one of my favorite new online shops where it's not only you know all the closet staples you ever need but it's also here to help me change my wardrobe from season to season shifting our wardrobe from summer to fall it's always a challenge at least on my part luckily quince offers timeless and high quality items that i I adore i adore them so much ensuring my wardrobe always stays fresh and i do not blow my budget like cashmere sweaters from $50, pants for every occasion, washable silk tops, and so much more. The best part is that all Quince items are priced 50 to 80% less than similar brands. By partnering directly with top factories, Quince cuts out the cost of the middleman and passes the savings on to us. Huzzah! And Quince only works with factories that use safe, ethical, and responsible manufacturing practices and premium fabrics and finishes. I love that. I am obsessed with my Quince 
women's leggings that are oh so soft and comfy. And I love to wear them for exercising around the house or out and about. They literally feel and look luxurious, aka expensive, but without the price tag. Make switching seasons a breeze with Quince's high quality closet essentials. Go to quince.com slash FFG for free shipping on your order and 365 day returns. That's Q-U-I-N-C-E dot com slash FFG to get free shipping and 365 day returns. Quince.com slash FFG. Let, let's get into the real battle here, yeah? The initial magic part is done. Everybody's shields have been wiped away by the other side's magic. The monsters are wreaking havoc on Hybern's army. Reese wields his dark power to mist a massive chunk of Hybern's army. Huzzah! Die, you motherfuckers! His targeted hit was well-placed, splitting the enemy forces in two. Can't forget Asriel's help as he unleashes his siphon power, pew pew, to drive the split enemy further apart from each other. And that's the signal for the Illyrians. Go, go, go! They're shooting down from the sky to attack, attack, attack! But oh no! Hybern has a legion of Adder Bartox! They kick him, sir! Kick him, sir! They rise up to go against the Illyrians, shooting Fabian arrows at them. Wait! Fabian arrows? Uh-oh, Hybern has adapted. Because while Nuon's Fabian antidote works within the soldier's veins, that antidote does not extend to their magic that they're wielding for shields. So these Fabian arrows are cutting right through the Illyrian's magical shields, which means the Illyrians have to switch to their metal shields to protect themselves. Back on the ground, Hybern lets its evil beasts loose against Tarquin, Helion, and Kaleas's soldiers that are charging at the enemy. Reese and Tarquin send and blasts of power into Hybern's forces to split and disorganize their lines. Moore and Vivian are fighting next to each other. Kaleas is spraying skin shredding ice at the enemy. Cassian is a flare of red siphon power at the front lines. Then we have Kyr's Darkbringers who are enveloping Hybern soldiers in darkness before ripping the shadows away to doubly blind the enemy with sunlight before driving their blades into them. That's such a cool tactic. Helium is shouting to Perithian's front lines to hold steady! Arrows are flying in all directions with the Hybern Fabian dipped arrows always seeming to find their mark because the king put a targeting spell on them that is really smart even if it's really bad for our crew. <laughs> While Bryaxis, the Bone Carver, and Striga are making dents in Hybern's ranks, their soldiers are quickly filling in to staunch the holes in their lines. There's just too many of them! One falls down and five more seem to appear. Needless to say, it's messy and the battle is raging. But Reese urges Amran, it's not time yet to go to the cauldron. The king won't be distracted enough to step away from guarding the cauldron yet. But then we hear a horn in the distance. <gasps> What's this? Hibern alleys? No. White walkers? No. It's the three armies of Autumn Court, Spring Court, and the humans! Huzzah! 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 As Eris explains to our crew, Tamlin dragged Baron out by the neck of the Autumn Court and forced him to rally his troops and join the Prithian army. You get a gold star for that, Tamlin. And Tamlin also seems to have won a little of his own court's loyalty back because he managed to rally his own small force for this battle. And who's leading the human army? Jurian! I'm so curious how he snuck away from Highburn to officially and openly join the other side. I suppose since they were already marching through the human lands, it couldn't have been that difficult. And he slipped to, you know, meet up with Grayson and this human army. But anyway, I love how much this surprises Highburn's army. It's a little chaotic on their side as they're trying to real time figure out how effed they are because of how much Jurian knows of their weaknesses. And uh, like you were saying last episode with Tamlin surprising the king of Highburn, it's like, oh my gosh. And Jurian gave him an even bigger surprise. Like, go Jurian and the humans. <laughs> it's honest. Well, the fact that the humans came to this battle especially Grayson's army, it cannot be understated. Humans, in comparison to Faye, they do not hold a candle, and they came here to go fight win. That is some really epic bravery here that I want to give nice credit to our human friends here. Not to mention the massive prejudice that Grayson, and I'm assuming his army as well, has against the Fae thanks to his father, who I'm assuming did not come to this battle because we hear nothing about him. I... I, that's my guess. <laughs> well, he's also old, so maybe he's like, I'm just going to hang back here and guard the house. <laughs> Sit in my grandpa chair, you know? 
Anyway, wasting absolutely no time upon their arrival, Eris's brothers strategically winnow to the enemy wagons full of Thebane, torching them into ash. Huzzah! Our side has destroyed the caches of Thebane. And they knew exactly where each was thanks to Tamlin or Jurian's information being hybrid spies. Good job, Autumn Court. Don't get used to us saying that. <laughs> this arrival at the opportune moment, it really is so fitting for this final showdown. And it won't be the last time I say that either. This book has been leading up to all seven courts uniting against Highburn, despite their differences and baggage with one another, especially, of course, with Tamlin, as we've been wondering since the end of last book, what his end goal is and how he will play a role in this final battle. And here we see it. They use the information the spies have gathered to destroy Highburn's Fabian that cripples our magical army. Yes, even with Nuan's antidote, it is still effective in battle against our crew. Even Baron's terrible sons play a helpful role, which, by the way, back in episode two, we speculated that they couldn't winnow because Eris was transporting with them. Turns out, I guess they can. Eris is stepping up and acting as commander versus Baron in this moment. Baron obviously does not want to be here, but like we discussed during the High Lord's meeting, he doesn't want to be on the wrong side of the war and lose his his position of power, aka his life. My guess is that if Tamlin hadn't come to drag him into action, he would have bided his time, staying out of it all so that he could claim neutrality no matter who won. I'm willing to bet Tamlin definitely threatened his life, so he had no choice but to join with Perithian or literally lose right then and there, which again highlights Tamlin's efforts that show what he's willing to do for the good of Perithian. He doesn't want anything to do with the Night Court either, but this is so much bigger than the courts. This is about protecting their world, their way of life and freedom from an oppressing king. Same goes for the humans. Of course, they're also going to face off the enemy as these fae fight for them. And while Grayson is still a piece of shit for how he dismissed Elaine, he believes in the cause and is brave enough to rally his armies, put aside his prejudices, and fight alongside these fae, probably with the help of Drain's coaxing, I'll be honest there. Drain did threaten his family <laughs> earlier on. <laughs> yeah. With this new development, of two courts and humans joining in the fight and destroying Hybern's precious Feybane. Now it's finally enough of a distraction for Amran and the Archeron sisters to go to the cauldron. So they start moving about, you know, 20 feet ahead and all seems to be going well for seconds. That is, until Nesta takes a shuddering gasp of an inhale, not unlike how she acted when the cauldron was being rallied to destroy the wall back at the end of the High Lords meeting. That is because, yet again, the cauldron is being riled up to be used in a bad, bad way. Oh, dear! Via her connection with the cauldron, Nesta is able to comprehend where it is rallying up its power to target. She knows that it is about to target the skies where their army is strongest, where Cassian is, in the center of the Illyrian Legion. We can guess she already knows or assumes where Cassian has been fighting, with the way she tends to keep her gaze on him as much as possible during battle. She's not here to watch the actual battle. She's here to watch over Cassian. And when when she realized that he is the cauldron's target, she knows that if she desperately calls for him, he will come to her and away from where the cauldron is about to blast because that is who Cassian is. They are connected. There is and has always been something between the two of them. And if Nesta needs him, he will come no matter what. She might not be able to save all the Illyrians. There's no way to communicate for a thousand of them to move out of the cauldron's way in time, but she is terrified right now and knows that she can at least save her future mate. Nesta frantically searches the skies, screaming Cassian! Over and over and over again. And a figure with red siphons shoots out of the ranks. He's about halfway to our crew on the ground, including you know the riding Nesta, when a huge blast hits the Illyrian forces, right where Cassian was fighting a moment prior. The Outer Legion ducked just in time, exposing only the Illyrians to the cauldron's white light blast. What did this mighty blast from the cauldron do though? Shredding not only through Asriel's shield, but also Resands, both of which we can assume were over this Illyrian legion, which I want to pause real quick. Go Asriel for having power like that to, I won't say match Reese's, but to support Reese's in that way. Like that is really cool. And then it shredded through each of the Illyrian soldier shields as well. And then a thousand Illyrian soldiers just died in a heartbeat and were absolutely destroyed. Only ashes were left in their wake. 
Knowing Cassian as well as we do, we can understand the terrible guilt he will feel and have to live with after this. He doesn't regret coming to Nesta's aid, but in a way, he just cheated death again, and this is a burden he will have to bear. There will be descriptions about the shadows in his eyes just really reflecting back and being haunted by this. He never wants another soldier to die on his behalf, especially a thousand of them. In Silver Flames, Nesta will confirm that the cauldron was targeting Cassian because he was such a strong player in the Prithian army. I'm not sure if Cassian ever learns this, though. Cassian is the general who personally shares bad news with the families of the fallen. He comforts those who need it and carries the weight of responsibility for his armies. He may know that soldiers will inevitably die, but he will always be the first to charge and risk his life for others, take responsibility for his soldiers in life and in death. I skimmed Frost and Starlight as well as Silver Flames, and I'll be honest, I was a little surprised the aftermath of this event doesn't weigh heavier on his conscience in the next books where we get his POV. That's not to say it isn't there by any means, but I think it does go to show that he doesn't blame Nesta for saving his life out of a thousand. But the cauldron's not done because it's riling up again for blow number two. Although this time it's focusing its energy on where the bone carver is. It's just gleefully shredding apart soldiers. I love the word gleefully there. That's great. <laughs> Quote, draining the life from them in sweeps and gusts of that deadly wind. But then the weaver shrieks an unearthly sisterly warning. But it is sadly too late. The cauldron's power rips through the bone carver and a lot of Highburn's own soldiers too, ending the bone carver for good. Feyre swears that the bone carver looks over at her smiling and is almost like, yay, and is at peace that this is the way he gets to go out. Even perhaps she wonders if he knew he wouldn't return to the prison and he might have already carved his own death in that cell. I also wonder if he carved his own death into the bone scimitar, the weapon that he's carrying onto the battlefield. Feyre thinks, quote, I wondered if the bone carver had made it to wherever he was so curious about going. This is, of course, a callback to all of the questions he was asking Feyre about where she went when she died. And I really hope you made it there, bone carver. R.I.P. You were spooky and terrifying and quite informative. You took this book to a whole new level of horror and added such depth to our characters with how he made them think differently. And most of all, you still owe us two motherfucking questions, you little asshole. <laughs> but RIP, right? RIP. <laughs> <laughs> yes, another informative being in this world gone too soon. And since the bone carver is now no longer with us, Feyre feels an empty plane where their bond via the bargain used to be. She also feels a sudden cold shuddering down her spine, quote, as if erasing the tattoo inked upon it. And so her gorgeous back tattoo of the four faces of the moon is assumably gone. Yes, it was a two-pronged bargain with the bone carver and Braxis, but I'm guessing her forearm band tattoo is still in place because she made the bargain with Braxis earlier. It's kind of confusing. Well, I, it's also fascinating because that tattoo is such a prominent visual for so many people in the Avatar series. Uh, yes. And it's on the page for like maybe... 18 pages <laughs> like and I actually went down quite a rabbit hole trying to figure this out because it was like wait that disappears because I actually thought that it stayed because her bargain with Bryaxis is still intact but I'm that's pretty clear that it felt like it was erased and then there's never a mention of it again like in fact I know at some point Reese like traces his finger down her spine and it said something about like where her tattoo used to yeah. be and so it it is gone and yeah and it it, it, like gone too soon like that is such a cool tattoo and i'm so right? sad it went away so quickly i'm still very confused how it was two-pronged but whatever we're <laughs> just gonna move past that back to the battle scene the bulk of the rest of the illyrian legion reformed the lines and are interdispersed with the peregrines as they fight in the skies tamlin baron and jurian's forces are battling the northern flank the human army is not bulking as they battle but they're slowly and surely going down tarquin helian and Calias are 
struggling to hold their host's line. And none of it is enough as Hybern's never ending army overwhelms them and begins to push them back. Our crew is panicked after seeing what the cauldron can do. It might have gone quiet for now, but those two big blows were devastating for our friends. And they realize they really do have no chance of victory if it strikes again. Did they kind of know that before? Yes, but now they're facing the reality after seeing it with how powerful the cauldron is and how outnumbered they are. Like it's one thing to just know it and then it's a whole other thing to see it in action. The original plan of the Archeron sisters and Amran going after the cauldron at the height of the battle is starting to fall apart. Elaine is throwing up from pure terror and Feyre realizes there is no way her sister will be able to cut through the battlefield toward the cauldron. And then there's Nesta who can barely sit after that power that just roiled through her with the cauldron. So there's no chance of her moving either. So Feyre wonders mind to mind with Amran if the cauldron can be taken down with just her and Amran. This is the first time we are ever seeing Feyre use her Daimati powers to communicate with someone back and forth in a conversation that is not Reese. Like, it was just kind of like there on the page and it was like, whoa, wait, <laughs> like, good I, job, girl. I was like, I think you're right. Yeah. Like I have not seen that happen before. Yep. And it's I not the remember. last. <laughs> it's not the last time because she'll do it with Cassian and Silver Flames. But yes. I was just like, oh, like little new trick unlocked. She kind of did it with Nesta when Nesta was seeking out the cauldron when she was crying. But that's different. Like she was yeah. literally inside of her mind versus this just mind to mind communication. But before this change of plans with just Amran and Thera going to the cauldron, we hear another horn. And this time it really is the White Walkers, or at least our Akatar equivalent, because oh dear, it's the rest of Hybern's army. Our crew is realizing too late that Hybern chose the seaside battlefield because it has an armada sailing in from the west which I have no idea how this is geographically possible since they are on the eastern coast. So technically, it should be from the south if this is Hyburn's armada sailing around the southern tip of the mortal lands to get to this eastern coast because they can't literally be coming in from the west. But anyway. Wait, wait, hot take, hot take. SJM does not know east and west. <laughs> this is not the first time we've had this conversation on the podcast. I always remember it as never eat soggy waffles. <laughs> You so oh, I, I, like, I that's just like so ingrained in my head. <laughs> This isn't Hybern's allies coming. It is the rest of Hybern's army, which at this point, I'm just throwing in the towel about how many soldiers there are. Like if we have 100,000 here that are already overwhelming our Perithian hosts, 60,000-ish, then first of all, the Lannister twins were wrong and Hybern has more than 100,000. Bottom line is, even with all seven courts and the human army, our crew is fucked and now they're sandwiched between Hybern's overwhelming terrestrial army, Adder Flying Legion, and countless ships teeming with more soldiers. You know that scene in Battle of the Bastards where John is like en engulfed entirely oh, yes. in this like circle of uh, Ramsey Bolton's army? Like, yes. That is all I see, but it's like also from above. Like, that's exactly what's happening here. Which I'm just going to be honest. They seemed so surprised that Hybern had an armada and it's like well why else would he choose a battlefield next to the sea but well, anyway to be fair, they did choose the eastern battlefield next to the when sea. it was coming in from the west <laughs> i don't know how that works but anyway knowing that they are indeed fucked how many times am i gonna say this this episode reese starts to tell Farah that if all goes to hell and he and the rest of their family are dead she needs to run before the battle when he said his goodbyes like nicole said it wasn't necessarily giving up before the fight started but it was being realistic as they knew the odds were stacked against them and they were going to fight the best that they could. Now things are shifting because losing this battle in war, it's about to happen. And their one shot is Amran and Feyre getting to the cauldron before this Hybern armada makes it to shore. Things are really, really bad for our friends. Reese sends As to lead the remaining Illyrians with the northern flank and Cassian to take the southern flank. And he knows that there's no chance of victory. He knows that he is sending his brothers to their deaths. Knowing Reese as well as we do and how he is always the first to self-sacrifice, this is tearing him apart. But he has to lead in this moment and they have to make this last push count. My darling Cassian is not afraid though, knowing that he is about to go to his death. I'll see you on the other side, he says to Reese, Feyre, and Nesta. And he does not mean the battlefield. But what's this? 
Another horn? A dozen horns? Reese and Cassian fly Farrah and Nesta into the sky to witness what is happening. And oh my God, thousands and thousands of winged soldiers are flying straight for them. Draken and his seraphims have entered the chat. While they fly over the sea, another armada with far more ships than Highburn, aka at least a thousand ships, sail toward the coast. And it includes Miriam's people and more from other nationalities, but we'll get to who that is in a moment because we got to talk about Draken and Miriam's arrival. The inner circle has tried looking for them to ask for help in this war, but Kirtea was seemingly empty and the inner circle had no idea where their friends had gone and no time to search the world for them. Remember how Jurian has been trying to coax Draken and Miriam out of hiding because he knows that Draken has a readily trained aerial legion that can potentially change the tides in this war. So he's been putting on quite the performance of hunting his ex-lover and her mate for revenge to get them to come out for the fight and face him slash Highburn, even though he actually wants to beg their forgiveness. And hey, Jurian's plan worked. Again! <laughs> Again? Go Jurian! Like, Jurian <laughs> is quickly becoming one of my favorite characters in this entire series because, A, he's able to keep a step ahead of Highburn, which is something that a lot of people can't say. <laughs> B, he surprises us, the reader, he surprises us, our crew, quite a lot. And his plans actually work. <laughs> Draken and Miriam heard through the rumor mill that there was an oncoming war with Highburn and Jurian was hunting Miriam. I'm still curious about this rumor mill, but we don't have time this episode to speculate more on this matter. And that's when Draken and Miriam put two and two together about why their friends hadn't asked them for aid. Turns out their glamour on Kirtea, very much like Valaris's, worked a little too well, so even friends would only see a ruin, which, yep, this is exactly what Asriel did see when he went looking for them there. Don't worry, we'll get more into this Drake and Miriam timeline in today's serial segment. But the point is, they are here now with the full might of their army to fight against Highburn, which of, of course they are. Miriam symbolizes the fight against good and evil more than anyone. She was half human and enslaved 500 years ago, and they fought in the last war alongside some of our inner circle members. They are good friends with Moore and Reese, who he sacrificed so much to save Miriam when she was captured by Amarantha. It's such a climatic moment that they arrive. Is it a little cheesy and unrealistic that they arrive at the height of battle? Sure, but so did Gandalf at Helm's Deep. <laughs> so I guess that was like timed with like the light of the dawn. But anyway, it's storytelling that keeps you on the edge of your seat and we're not going to question it. And hey, the Seraphim probably had scouts and learned where the battle was taking place. So they steered their host in the right direction and made haste to make it in time. Like all seven courts and the humans uniting, Draken's arrival has been building up for two books now. We've been learning about him and Miriam for so long and wondering how how the heck they're going to enter our story. And ta-da! Here they are at the final showdown. And goodness, like, would we expect any less? Nope. <laughs> the surprises, they keep on surprising, though, because along with Draken's Seraphim Legion and Miriam's ships, there is a second group of ships intermingled, quote, more than Highburn's Armada, far, far more. Apparently, when Draken and Miriam were mid-flight here, they saw this behemoth of a human armada led by Queen Vasa crossing the channel, and they decided to join ranks with each other. The Seraphim even gave them a little magical wind push so that they would get here faster, although that did also slow them down, and they were like, we would have been here sooner, and it's like, so would thousands of Illyrians. <laughs> so of course. Oh. <laughs> immediately believes that this is Lucian who found Vasa from his mission on the continent. And Draken's like, Who's that? Lucian was actually not the one who found Vasa, but he did meet up with this big human armada and tell them to hurry, hurry, go, go, go. So then the question stands. Who found Vasa and who is leading this armada with her? I am quoting this entire thing because it is too damn perfect. Quote. He calls himself the Prince of Merchants. Apparently, he discovered the human queens were traitors months ago, and he's been gathering an independent human force to face Highburn ever since. He managed to find Queen Vasa, and together they rallied this army. He told me that he's got three daughters who live here, and that he failed them for many years. But he would not fail them this time! Chills! Pause. How did he know that the queens were traitors? How did he know all three of his daughters lived in Prithian now? 
Some good questions. Those, those are very some good, good questions. You I have so okay. many more questions about Papa Archer on here that I'm going to get to here. Soon. I've got I've got a head cannon. His fellow traders in Prith- in Prithian were telling him through the rumor mill because apparently it's been working over time that his three daughters are now Fae and all live in Prithian. He also told them about everything going on with Jurian because maybe you know this merchant, this fellow merchant worked with Jurian. That's my head cannon right there. Even though that was 500 years ago. Even though that was 500 years ago. <laughs> Leading these thousands of ships are three, with the names of the three Archeron sisters clearly marked. The Feyre, the Elaine, and of course, leading the charge, flying over the waves without an ounce of fear, is the Nesta, with Papa Archeron at the helm. Chills again. It's so good. As rightfully hard as we've been on Papa Archer on this podcast, this is such a satisfying moment. This is a man who was <clears throat> never there for his daughters when they needed him most, to the point where one outright hated him. Honestly, I'm shocked it was just one, if I'm being honest. But as we wondered during our Akatar coverage, when the glamour lifted when Feyre was back in the human lambs after Tamlin slept with her and he was like, you need to go back. I'm going to save you and not my entire court. We wonder if the glamour was um, the glamour lifting. It was almost like his wake up call. In fact, we wondered if one of the reasons he wasn't there to say goodbye to Pharaoh when she was going to go back to the spring court was because he was already jumping into action to prepare to head to the continent and call this meeting. Maybe call in a favor from the realm led by Queen Vasa that is rich in trade and arms. He realized that one of his daughters was so brave that she went into Prithian with Manver Pig to protect the entire family. Not only one of his daughters, his youngest daughter. And maybe, just maybe, it was time for him to be useful and brave too. So points for you. You finally did it. <laughs> and like you're saying, this doesn't wash away how useless Papa Archeron has been for years. But he's also righting a lot of wrongs in this grand gesture. And Papa Archeron deserves to be recognized for jumping into action in such a big way when it matters most. Not just for his daughters, but for the entire world. This conflict of emotions about being unable to forgive what he previously did, or rather didn't do, and feeling so much love and appreciation for what he ultimately did do do will be a reoccurring theme for especially Nesta once we get to her story. I think it's also very reflective of people in general where it, it's really it can be really hard to forgive someone who really wronged you even if things are going so right and there can be just such a conflict of emotions working through that past hurt and hatred and it not aligning with the current feelings and actions that they're taking now. It's almost like we're going to be talking about that at nauseum in Soul Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> and who chooses bravery again with Papa Archeron soaring over the waves fast as a shooting star with red and gold and white embers trailing off of it? It is Vasa, the firebird. I do wonder just how much Papa Archeron knew of slash learned about his feathered companion. I imagine he knows everything. Yes. So Papa Archeron and Vasa got to know each other very well to the point that Vasa says that he was a better father to her than her own. She'll say she owes him so much and will honor him as long as she lives. Oh, I can't wait to get into that moment in next episode. But I, I, how much do you think he knows about Koshje? Well, he was the one who negotiated with Koshje and cut the deal with him to allow Vasa to temporarily leave the lake, which I have so many questions what? about. Wait, what? Yes. Okay, here's my un- my personal unhinged theory. Are you ready for this? He offered Coast J spices and gems. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> I'm totally kidding. I have no idea. Do you have any? Do you have any idea how this happened? Okay, so I, I've been doing some thinking here. I assume that around the time of the continent meeting, Papa Archeron figured out what happened to Vasa, and it would have happened pretty soon beforehand or something. Like it all happened kind of around the same time. Did he know someone with knowledge on the inside? Side because he traded with her territory when he was the Prince of Merchants. And then, of course, we have the big question of what kind of deal did he cut with Koshje? By Silver Flames, Vasa is still temporarily free, so she's able to be gone from the lake for over a year. Koshje won't just do that willy-nilly, and the deal has to have something to do with Vasa's armies, I'm assuming, because after the battle, she will say that she doesn't have much time left before she must return to the lake 
but quote, with the healing of our armies, I won't be able to leave for some time. Perhaps it will give me a loophole, as Lucian called it, to remain longer. We'll find out at the end of Silver Flames that Coach J will later be waiting for her, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Bottom line is, I have so many questions about how Papa Archeron was able to negotiate this deal to temporarily free her with Coach J. This is either a very convenient plot point or potentially leading up to a big reveal if Coach J ends up being the big bad villain in the next book. I'm leaning towards very convenient plot <laughs> point. I am too. But there's, a, but there's a lot there. And I want to know more about what the heck is going on with Vasa and Coach J and where Papa Archeron fits into all of it. How the hell did Papa Archeron, with a a death god. <laughs> a death yes, god. I know. <laughs> yes. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Our girl Feyre is always learning more and more about loving herself, communication with her mate, and of course, about her powers, like communicating Daemoni style with Amran. And who says that continuing that education is just for our fantasy characters? In my personal therapy journey, it has been so helpful from learning new things about myself, about anxiety coping exercises. I literally have an entire note on my phone that is just nonstop anxiety coping exercises. It's amazing. And so much more. Therapy can help you reconnect with your sense of wonder and of course, learn new skills because your back to school era can come at any age. Therapy has also been so huge for me in the season of my life as I continue to learn more about myself and really how to balance everything with my family, my work and taking care of me. There's always so much going on in life, but therapy has made it possible for me to check in with myself more intentionally. I find myself looking forward to my sessions every week, and I know that they're helping me to become the person that I really want to be. If you're thinking about starting a therapy journey, give BetterHelp a try. It is entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Rediscover your curiosity with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com FFG today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H E-L-P dot com slash F-F-G. And back to the battle, because Vasa might be cursed in Firebird by day, but she is putting that firepower to good use against Hybern ships. As she burns Hybern's fleet, Draken tells Cassian his legion is Cassian's to command. During his relaying of orders of this new plan to our, you know, Draken allies and everything, Draken's eyes go glazed and Feyre assumes that he is conveying the orders to someone far away. Is Draken also a Demati? What is happening? At this point, who knows? You know, maybe he's communicating with Miriam and this is all a mates thing and not a Demati thing, even though I don't think Cassian and Nesta will have the specific ability. No. Like they'll be able to sense each other and like feel each other's feelings through their bond, but they can't mind to mind communicate this clearly. And then there's when Cleus spoke to Vivian when he was getting entrapped by Amarantha. They weren't mates yet. So I don't know how the two of them spoke if they weren't mates, because as far as we know, Cleus is not a Daymati. I don't know. I give well, up trying to figure this out. To be fair, Reese and Feyre were also speaking to each other prior to being mates, but they are Daymati. So yeah, so I'm not they're kind of I'm taking them off the plate okay, here. Okay, okay. We're looking specifically at how do Cleus and Vivian communicate with each other before they were mates and before he was a high lord, and how does Draken assumably communicate here with Miriam? We don't know that he's communicating with her, but we can guess because maybe, she is his mate. Maybe Cassian and Nesta are the anomaly because Nesta is made from the cauldron itself. So maybe there's some Something, maybe there's something there. Honestly, I need something to make sense. I'm going to be on I the do too. But this. again, Vivian and Cleus were not I, mates yet. <laughs> so, ah, uh, cauldron boil cauldron me. Cauldron boil me. <laughs> In the midst of this new army coming and offering new strength to fight against Hybern, it is finally time for Amran and Farah to move. But they know that no matter what, the king won't leave the cauldron's side. And it'll be too difficult for Amran and Farah to go head to head with the king. So our crew needs Needs to draw him far away, which is where Nessa's plan forms. Use her as bait. The king doesn't know how much power she took from the cauldron, and she can make it seem like she's about to use the cauldron's power, which will be the only thing to draw the king away from the actual cauldron. He is already on a mission to stop Nesta, and he'll be too tempted to kill her once and for all. He thinks that she's about to unleash cauldron power. To which Reese is like, um, 
no, that is a stupid idea, which I actually disagree. This is a genius idea. Classic Nesta is like, you're not my high lord. I can do what I wish, which I'm kicking myself for not starting a you're not my high lord count at the beginning of this book. I think we're up to two. I think this is two, (laughs) but Silver Flames is going to rack that number way (laughs) higher. Cassian will ensure the king doesn't kill Nesta and be her guard for this trap. For the upteenth time, Cassian is sacrificing himself for the greater good. And in the specific instance for Nesta, although she is also sacrificing herself for this trap, understanding and walking into the highest of high risks that they won't make it out alive. They understand they're about to lay down their lives to draw the king away from the cauldron, to buy the other's time to stop this war without a second thought. They're even embracing it. As Cassian says to Reese, who, like you said, is not about this idea and it's not necessarily because it is a stupid idea in and of itself it's because he doesn't want his friends to die for this quote save some of the glory for the rest of us it's a heartbreaking moment between him and reese two brothers who each want to protect the other and are willing to sacrifice themselves in the process as far as we're all concerned this is the final goodbye to cassian as he and nesta take off to set the trap for the king of hybern as Reese is flying Favor down to meet with Elaine and Amran, Favor says to her mate that Cassian still might survive this distraction, being, you know, a nice little optimist, to which Reese says, no, he won't. Such a heartbreaking moment. Like, I just like, oh, my goodness. But also, technically, he's really right. If it weren't for Elaine's disruption and her own prophecy, Cassian and Nesta would have died. So technically, he is correct. Technically. <laughs> And finally, Amran and Feyre run through the battlefield to get to the cauldron. Feyre shields them from sight, and Amran warns her to try not to kill so they don't leave a trail. Amran enthusiastically bursts through the king's wards until they reach Striga, who has positioned herself near the cauldron, waiting for them. I love on the hill where Highburn is described. It's like described as gray, as if it was completely leached of color and life, much like the island of Highburn itself. Yes. Within enemy lines, we learn that the Highburn commanders aren't even fighting yet as they wait for the battle to sort out the grunts from the true warriors. It's crazy because they are still getting overrun and all of that, and Highburn hasn't even unleashed his top fighters yet. Feyre notes that even with Draken and the human army, the battle is not going well for our friends. Good thing they're almost at the cauldron. The beautiful, dark-haired, young Striga, because remember, she gets her youth and beauty from feasting on life, and she is having quite the buffet today. She creates a diversion for them. Just as Nesta rallies her power and the plan is working, the King of Hybern is focused on Nesta's rumble of power and the nearby Striga, and we get a chilling sequence. The King praises Striga, and she takes up her role of godhood, basking like it was in the before times when the ancient fae worshipped her. Quote, you may bow, king, as it was once done. Read that and tell me that she's not Daglin. Like, what else would this mean? Because it was before the Daglin came that she was considered a god. I Uh, thought, I I think. I didn't think so. I thought it was at this, like, kind of similar times. Put a pin pin in that because that (laughs) would also mean that the bone carver is too. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> I, I have a different theory that they're not exactly Daglin, but they are very similar. And I can't say it right now Fine. without giving Throne of Glass spoilers. Cool, 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 cool. All right. I just, okay. That, continue. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but oh no, the king snaps her neck before the death god can stop him. Look right there. That is why she can't be Daglin. <laughs> All right. I'll give you that. I'll give you that. Because <laughs> I'm about to go on a rant here. Go for it. Give me the is not sure this would kill her. But then the king throws Striga down to the Naga hounds and they rip her body apart. R.I.P. Weaver of the Woods, you beautiful death god. May you join your twin brother wherever he hoped he would go. You may have been a really scary hoarding monster, but in the end, you died fighting for your home Prithian. Okay, now is when I'm going on my rant. Thank God. Because I can get behind the cauldron blasting the bone carver to smithereens. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm very sad. I love the bone carver, but I can absolutely understand it. Cauldron is built up to be so powerful that it is easy to accept his death as an immortal being here. But this is such a human way to die for Striga, who was at the top of the food chain in the middle for centuries and centuries. And like we've been saying, she was a death god beforehand. 
These death gods are true immortals and from a different world. They're not supposed to be able to be killed, according to Lanthus, in Silver Flames. We've talked endlessly about how powerful they are. And I get that the king himself does not fear her or, and, and he has his own power. But then she dies by her neck getting snapped and then just ripped apart by hounds. It feels very anticlimactic. <laughs> I suppose the fact that the King of Hybern was able to best her shows that she was too caught up in her vain otherly worldness. He so easily tricked her so she didn't see it coming. But I don't know. She deserved a, a better death that is more fitting for an immortal being, whether it is with a sword that is able to kill immortals, like what happens with Lanthus, whether it is the cauldron with the bone carver, like... I don't know. It's just such a huge, like, literally, like, this is how Papa Archeron is killed in a few chapters. Retweet everything you said. <laughs> this is, it, this makes me unnecessarily angry. The only way I can rationalize this is that it was on the page for us to really understand how at the height of his power King of Hybern is. But then he's not even using well, his powers. Powers. Like, how would you <laughs> have a crazy spell that we've never heard of? Like, I would be so much happier with this like crazy out there spell that's just like on the pages, like plot, you know, devices or whatever. But she, like you said, she dies in the same way as Papa Archeron, which no offense to super useful always Papa Archeron. You ain't no striker, my guy. <laughs> like, this is ridiculous. And like, I get like, you know, like, and then she's like ripped apart by the hounds. And so technically there's nothing left of her to stay immortal. But again, it's, she has lived for thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years. It doesn't add up to me. Anyway. Nope, me neither. Cauldron boil me. <laughs> Speaking of death, now that the king has done away with Striga, boo, you suck king of Highburn, he zeroes his focus in on Nesta. And Thera feels such paralyzing grief as she realizes this is the moment. Nesta and Cassian are sacrificing themselves so that Thera and Amran can reach the cauldron unguarded. Quote, you make it count, Amran snapped, and that was true grief shining in her eyes. She knew what was about to happen, the window that we'd been bought. Oh, I can just like feel like goosebumps right now. Once again, I genuinely thought we'd get major character deaths in this final showdown because of all the buildup. Or maybe I'd just been too engulfed in the Game of Thrones world. I don't know. Yes, but Game of Thrones, one of the reasons I think that it is so, you know, we do lose major characters. It's realistic. Like that would happen that the red wedding or like all of that kind of stuff with people would die on the battlefield that we've known for seasons. Like it, it makes sense. So yes, I agree. And we'll, we will get to that next episode, <laughs> but charging up the hill to a steep rock face, there sits the looming black pit of hate and power, the cauldron, which I love that Feyre says it's almost as tall as Amran is. Like, I love how Feyre always <laughs> finds time to dig at Amran's height. <laughs> like, so if you had to guess, how tall do you think Amran is? Like five feet. Her Illyrian leathers are made for a child. And you do realize think? that's three inches shorter than we are, right? Like that is. Yeah. Well, so I, I do think tall. because I, I do think that she's probably like maybe like five, two. Interesting. I was thinking like four two. They're also fey, so they're true. automatically taller than we are in general. That's true. We are a little, <laughs> we are a little short. <laughs> there is no time to waste, though. Knowing that she can stop all of this right now by using the magical bob spell from Amran, Feyre puts her hands on the cauldron. Quote, the cauldron's endless power slammed into me, a wave threatening to sweep me under a storm with no end. If you remember back in Akamath, when Feyre put her hands on the cauldron for the first time and she was ready to speak the spell from the bob, there is this pain and unbelievable amount of power that absolutely washes over her. Quote, a jolt passing through me as if I were no more than a lightning rod. With both the bob and the cauldron, this is how she has one hand on bob and she has one hand on the cauldron. Plus, without her experience of the Ouroboros, it was absolutely impossible to hold on to any semblance of herself. So instead, she got totally lost to not only the cauldron's power, but also its, its whisperings to her. 
This time, however, she holds on to who she is at her core. She clings to her identity so she doesn't lose herself the way she did last time from the cauldron. She has this ability because she had looked into the Ouroboros mirror. It fundamentally changed her, causing a shift not only in her self-reflection, but also in her inner power and a sense of self. It's because when she was looking in the Ouroboros mirror, she had to have this unbelievable amount of control over her own mind to say... I like this is who I am and not get lost to the power of the mirror. It's the exact same thing here, like Lexi said. Now, remember, the original plan was for all four of the maid people to read the spell from the Bob and put a lock on Highburn's power, thus also on his army, which would result in vanquishing them all together and, you know, ending the war once and for all. Huzzah! But because Thera is stronger and can hold on to her sense of self in a way literally no one else in this world can, she is strong enough to do it without her sister's aid. But Amran is not pulling out the bob to read from it. No, no. Only after watching Feyre for a long moment, as if to make sure she is stuck, super glued to the cauldron, does Amran then shove Bob behind her with a keek. That's interesting. I interpreted it as her stealing herself for what's about to go down. She has that long look because she really does care about Thera and doesn't like what she's about to do, but knows that it's necessary. Oh, interesting. I thought it was like, a okay, make sure, make sure we're good. All right. keep going. (laughs) That's how I always interpreted it because I think Amran is so not in emotions right now. She is in get the next thing done, the next thing done, the next thing done, because this is ultimately her goal, right? To Un- True, un- but she's also pretty apologetic for Amron. <laughs> yeah, which, which is a big deal for her to be apologetic in the first place, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> well, and it dawns on Feyre that Amron has indeed lied. She never planned to use Bob to unleash Highburn's army. Dun dun dun. I remember so vividly reading this for the first time when like Amron kicks, you know, Bob into the background. And I thought it was gonna be this surprise, I've been with Highburn all along moment. <laughs> and when I tell you, I was so, because I love Amarin. I was livid, but also I was kind of like, oh, I'm surprised. Like this is like, it was a cool storytelling moment, even though it didn't end up happening. Me, I I was so confused yeah. about what was happening. And it was like, oh my God, is Amarin actually portraying Farrah and her friends? I, I do think that there's a little bit of extra dramatic flair here for the shock value because she more just misleads Farah versus completely betrays her like it's set up to be. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> because, speaking of which, Amrin is not going to use the Bob spell to leash Highburn's power. She is instead going to use a Bob spell to unbind herself from her fey body, thus becoming her full angel of death form, which then will end Highburn's army. So the end goal is still the same. It's just the way of going about it is different. Like I said, she just misled them. Yeah. (laughs) Amran needs Feyre to serve as a conduit for her with this unbinding spell. She does not expect Feyre's conscience to get whisked away by the cauldron, which is why she'll yell at her to fight it once when she comes back to herself. She needs Feyre to fully keep her sense of self in her own body to be the conduit for Amran. So why would Amran do this and again, it's not lie. It's mislead members of her family. Like I mentioned back in episode nine, there was no guarantee that the High Lords would have signed off on Amran unbinding herself and this being the deus ex machina for the entire war getting won. Remember, she is a scary monster who many people grow up hearing horror stories about, like like Lucian said earlier in this book. So hearing, hey, I'm going to unleash myself might not go over very well. Amran is also not known for being very sentimental. But who is? The inner circle. And she needed them to focus on the task at hand rather than focus on saying goodbye to her. Also, Amran has wanted this for years, we can imagine, based on her reaction to Reese telling her that she might be able to unbind herself last book. So she didn't want anything to jeopardize this, thus keeping this secret to herself. And of course, like we've mentioned, this is also purely mainly shock factor for the reader, which this shock factor, I'm not super mad about. This was like a cool shock factor. Oh, me too. Yeah. Yeah. Like I'm on board with it. Yeah. Yeah. With Feyre gripping the cauldron and feeling betrayed by Amran with the switch up from their plan to annihilate Highburn, she holds onto her sense of self with everything she has. But soon enough, the cauldron causes her tether to herself to slip and she is half gone. The best way I can describe it is her body is still physically there with the cauldron on the hill, but the cauldron's 
conscious, for lack of a better word, has grabbed hold of Feyre and she is tangled with it. She is still herself, but she is mentally anchored to the cauldron as they fly through this battlefield because the cauldron is on the hunt for Nesta's rumble of power, its power that it wants back. And as the cauldron searches for Nesta and the source of its missing power, Feyre and us readers get a unique view of the battlefield. Once again, we see just how bad the Prithian side is losing despite its best efforts. We even see Reese transform into his beast form that he never likes to unleash. He is someone who likes to stay in control, keep himself in check, and his inner beast is the opposite of that. But right now, when all seems lost, he unleashes the beast within. Talons, dark scales, or maybe feathers that cover his body, arms, and chest. Quote, it was a thing of nightmares, nothing human or fey in it. It was a creature that lived in black pits and only emerged at night to hunt and feast. The face. It was those creatures that have been carved into the rock of the court of nightmares that made up his throne. The throne, not only a representation of his power, but of what lurked within. Reese isn't the only one letting his inner beast out. Helion, too, who is his daytime equivalent with golden feathers and shredding claws and feathered wings. And together they unleash themselves upon Highburn. Helion finds a match in a Highburn commander who it seems they finally are wanting to play. But we don't have time to watch because zoom, zoom. Zoom, zoom. The cauldron keeps moving, realizing that the power it seeks is not on the battlefield. I did not have a Xenon 21st century <laughs> on my bingo cards episode. Oh my God. What a Disney Channel original movie throwback. <laughs> so I love that song so much. Zoom, Make my heart zoom, go boom, 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 boom. My supernova girl. <laughs> So I wonder if the cauldron was drawn to these two high lords and their unleashing of power because it was wondering if that was the source of the power that it was hunting for. And then when it realized that, nope, that's not the source, that it's still on the hunt for Nesta, that's when it, you know, like moved away and zoomed, zoomed, zoomed away. And then Nesta's power, it's singing to the cauldron to come. Either it's almost like it's taunting the cauldron or it's calling to it to be reunited with all of its full power. I'm leaning towards the latter. That yeah. that feels really apt. And especially why the cauldron was like, oh my God, I got to go now, now, now and yeah. take you with me. Like, I, yeah, that definitely makes sense. Feyre and the cauldron arrive at the clearing where Nesta and Cassian are before the king arrives. And remember, they are not physically there, just her conscience is attached to the cauldron spirit seeking out its power. Quote, I was neither seen nor heard where I was nothing but a scrape of soul carried on a black wind. Knowing that the king is coming, Nesta rallies her power to attack attack him. But then her power dies out because the king is too smart to fall for her trap and he's brought his own shield, a human shield that is, because he's holding Papa Archer on a sword point. So you're saying one more time, our knight court is not one step ahead of the King of Highburn and he's actually one step ahead of them. Just saying. Yep. Again. Yep. Bad to the bone, King of Highburn is just loving this as he taunts Nesta, now unable to land the killing blow, unable to hurt her father. Knowing that he's not going to get out of this alive, Papa Archeron uses his last moments to tell his eldest daughter what's in his heart. Quote, I loved you from the moment I held you in my arms. And I am, I am so sorry, Nesta, my Nesta. I am so sorry for all of it. Again, we might have some grudges against this Papa Archeron, but you can feel his heartfelt apology that has been weighing on his heart for years. Her father's last words to her will plague Nesta moving forward as she's haunted by her quite complex feelings about her hatred for her father, yet her innate need to protect him and save him in this moment. But all she can do here is beg the king of Highburn and agree to whatever he asks her, whatever he wants, even if it means carving her power out of her so long as he does not hurt her father. We know how much Nesta hates not being in control. And here she is as vulnerable and helpless as we've ever seen her. Papa Archeron, he is not taking this shit sitting down, though, committing to what he said to Draken about wanting to protect and fight for his daughters that he neglected for years. He begins to threaten the King of Highburn. Quote, don't you lay your filthy hands on my daughter. I want to take a moment and compare this to when Feyre was about to be taken away by Man Bear Pig back in episode one of Akatar. Yes, the environment was a little bit different, but not like there was still a lot of unknown factors and children in danger there. He said, quote, please, good sir. Favorite is my youngest. I beseech you to spare her. She is all, she is all. 
and then his voice trails off. These two reactions to his daughter is in danger could not be more opposite. And I truly don't believe it's a, well, that was Feyre and this is Nessa. Like, I don't think it's like he loves one daughter more than the other. It's instead showing just how much this man has had a change of heart until, quote, I heard the crack before I realized what happened. Before I saw my father's head twisted, saw the light freeze in his eyes. While Feyre begins screaming, and Elaine will too shortly, Nesta does not make a sound at her father's death. Instead, she kneels before her father with her face completely void and her hands steady as stone. We know as readers, especially readers of Silver Flames, that this is not from a lack of feeling. But instead, it is that Nesta is someone who is not there to scream and shout. She is someone who will bury these emotions and this trauma deep, deep with inside of herself. And while we're literally going to have an entire book deep dive on how much this alters Nesta, I do want to pull out one moment from when she and Cassian go to the lake and she breaks down about this experience that she had here. She says in Silver Flames, quote, he came to save me and fought for me and I let him die with hate in my heart. Let him die is such an interesting choice of words here because obviously it's not true. Nesta could not have done anything in this moment. Like we just mentioned, she was completely out of control to stop the King of Highburn, but she believed so much at her core that she didn't deserve his love and caring and his finally saving her in this war because of how much she hated him for many years and because she, quote, let him die. This staring at his body is the shock of her realizing that she believes she was not deserving of his love in the end. It's realizing that her anger at him for not fighting for his daughters followed him all the way to his death, and she never gets to have that moment of closure with him. And because of that, she officially believes in this moment that she is deserving of nothing. This is such a a changing moment for Nesta in her journey and her story arc. Absolutely. Well, and then just go like all of that. And then just even like the small detail of the sound of his neck snapping, it will traumatize her to the point that she can't stand to be near fires. It's almost like it triggers all of those emotions that she has to bury deep, deep down because the crackling and the snapping wood will sound like her father's neck breaking. Yeah. RIP Papa Archeron, the Prince of Merchants. You may have been mostly off the page in this series, but your presence has been felt for better or worse throughout this story. And in the 11th hour, you proved yourself and your past month's efforts. You picked yourself up once you had money again, but we're not going to focus on that right now, and took action when few humans were willing to. You were apparently a fantastic negotiator (laughs) to temporarily free Vasa from her keeper's lake, and you did your best to make it up to your daughters when they and the whole world was in dire need of help. Why didn't he use those amazing negotiation skills to get his daughter out of Man Bear Pig's clutches? <laughs> because then he was w- given up at that point. Because well, yeah. also then we wouldn't have had a story. Anyway, <laughs> we will never forget you, King of Spices. <laughs> Being my coziest self this fall starts with a few essentials like good smelling candles, fuzzy blankets, and delicious chili. I love a good pork green chili. But the most important of all of this is my new Dream Seam underwear from Me Undies. Dream Seam delivers buttery soft comfort, freeing you to express yourself, knowing you'll never have to worry about that unnecessary VPL, visible panty lines, or discomfort ever again, which is extra important in leggings season. I live in leggings and really do need underwear that does not show that I am, you know, wearing the underwear there. <laughs> so I brought my dream team underwear on my honeymoon to Europe because when we were going to Europe, it was hot in Italy. And I kid you not, I put them on and I did not stop talking about them the entire day to the point where Brett was like, can you please stop talking about your underwear? We're around a lot of people right now. What I love about these ultra light undies, they are virtually invisible under any type of clothing, ensuring that you can wear it with confidence. You know that it will never create unwanted lines or bulges. And most importantly, they are the coziest underwear you will ever own. And best of all, Me Undies offers Dream Seam products in all sizes from extra small to 4XL. We love that Me Undies is all about body inclusivity and everyone can find a pair that work best for them. Comfort is more than a dream this fall with Me Undies' new Dream Seam line. Get 20% off your first order plus free shipping at MeUndies.com slash FFG. Me Undies, comfort from the outside in. 
Also, we love talking to you all about your me undies when we see you at live events. Like the bonding that we all have over me undies underwear is amazing. So at the Dragon Gauntlet event, I bonded with a listener who also got a pair of the narwhal underwear. And then the next day I see her and I'm like, hi. And she's like, I brought you a stuffed narwhal. And it's just the best thing ever. It lives on my bed. Like, so I have like, a, I have a toothless dragon on my bed and now I have a stuffed narwhal. And every time I see it, I think about my me and these are narwhal underwear and this listener which sounds weird but i promise it's not thank you listener that brings more joy to me than you'll ever know <laughs> well there's no transition back to this episode here so i'm just gonna jump right on in nesta's power may have flickered out with their father's death before her very eyes but cassian takes the opportunity to launch himself at the king because as shitty of a turn of events this was, they still have a mission to accomplish. Distract the king, try to take him down, and give Nesta the chance to run away. Feyre is fighting against the cauldron's grip on her soul, trying to get back to her body on the hill, but she can't will herself back. And as Cassian goes up against the king, Nesta says a silent farewell to her father before jumping back into action. Quote, and when she lifted her head, the cauldron thrashed and roiled, for in Nesta's eyes lined her skin uncut power but cassian is badly injured oh my poor cassian elaine's vision of his broken body is coming true before our very eyes oh my god his siphon power is empty he drained his magic before he and nesta set this trap for the king but of course he stepped up to the plate anyway for nesta for this distraction so Thera and amran could accomplish their goal with the cauldron even though he knows it means his death. Nesta won't have any of that. She might not have been able to save her father, but she sure as hell won't let the king take away another loved one from her. Side note, I find the cauldron so interesting through this. Quote, the cauldron crept along with Nesta, a hound at her side. We have speculated that the cauldron does not like the king of Highburn despite being in his possession. So is it cozying up with Nesta in solidarity of her destroying the king? Although we also know the cauldron hates Nesta for what she took from it and it's literally hunting her down and that's why it's here right now never forget it took elaine from nesta as retribution but it's like the cauldron has agreed that the king is their common enemy and now it's on nesta's side i don't know i just have to wonder also if nesta senses the cauldron here she must right i would assume so especially given yeah. how close they are to it i also imagine like you know when the stalking the animal stalk like i think about our cat miko right you know like miko like walks up to things and is super slow and then it pounces. it. So I wonder if that's what the cauldron's being. But I like your idea better where it's almost like, hey, that king of Highburn, he's a bitch. Let's, <laughs> let's, let's, let's go up against him <laughs> together and kill him. <laughs> like, I like that much more. Uh, Nesta once again rallies her power and this time she unleashes it. And while the king winnows to nearby safety, she takes out hundreds of Highburn soldiers behind her. Like, Damn, Nesta, good job. My poor Cassian is crawling toward her, unable to move more than his broken bones and wings are allowing him. Nesta grabs his Illyrian sword and turns to go head to head with the King of Highburn. My name is Nesta Archeron. You killed my father. Prepare to die. This is insane to think of. Remember that Nesta said way back when in this book that there's no point in training when there are others to do the killing for her. But there is no one else to help her in this moment. Her power is spent. She knows this is the end, but Nesta won't go down without a fight. She is mustering her raw courage, anger, and straight up adrenaline to taunt the king and lure him away from Cassian. But this untrained young and new fae female can't possibly stand a chance against the king of Highburn himself. He disarms her in two movements and strikes her across the face. Not cool, dude. He's sick of this Nesta archer on being a thorn in his side. But at the same time, he's entertained by her feeble efforts, so confident that he's about to win because honestly, why wouldn't he be? With the last bit of her power, Nesta sends white burning power, silver flames, into the king's chest, Wah! sending him flying back with so much force that trees are snapping in his wake. While the king is picking his dignity off the ground, <laughs> Nesta races back to Cassian and begs him to get up, trying to haul him up, but he's too jacked, I mean too heavy. Cassian urges her to go save yourself, but Nesta can't leave him. She doesn't know it in this 
moment. But I think that can't go so much deeper than I don't want yeah. to. She and Cassian may not officially be mates yet, but their souls are already connected and they are drawn to each other on the deepest level. She not only won't leave her mate, she can't. And I'm not saying that magic is physically preventing her. It's more like her soul is physically preventing her where she cannot. So knowing that the king is coming back to finish them off and Nessa's power is out, she has no way of beating him in a sword fight. They know that this is the end and they are choosing to leave this world together. Nesta is choosing to die with Cassian instead of run to possibly live another day without him in this life. Just like other mates we know, I would not be a Cassian girly if I didn't quote one of the most beautiful passages of this entire book. Quote, I have no regrets in my life but this, that we did not have more time, that I did not have time with you, Nesta. And then they kiss! He goes on brushing the tear from Nesta's face. Quote, I will find you again in the next world, the next life, and we will have that time. I promise. This is why Cassian is my number one book boyfriend. I love you forever. Those Cassian words of I will find you in the next life might not exactly come to life as intended, i.e. after dying, but they will kind of have this moment. They will find each other in the next chapters of their own life and how different of a life it will be for Nesta. So I love that it does end up coming true. We will find each other in a next life, but it's this next phase of our lives where yet yeah, maybe not Cassian, but Nesta becomes a different person. And while we will talk about this a lot more in Ross and Starlight and especially Silver Flames, I want to address the fandom's frustration about how quickly things will change between Nesta and Cassian. In this moment, they are on the brink of death and their love for one another is on full display. We have been building up to this climax <laughs> of them being open about their feelings for one another. There is no more time in this life and they want each other to know that they care deeply, will protect one another until they leave this world together. Fast forward to Frost and Starlight, and we learn much will change. Nesta will treat Cassian worse than she ever has. And the fandom, understandably, wonders why there is such a drastic change in her attitude toward him after this beautiful and heart-wrenching moment. And we will be talking about it at length. But even in this episode, I'm still not done, but we'll get to that in a few moments. <laughs> but then, just as the king lifts his hand, like Night King style, and moments before he murders these two, quote, a choking sound came out of him. Nice man. And a blade, <laughs> a black blade protrudes from the king of Hybern's throat. Elaine, Elaine, coming in with the Arya Stark level shocker. Quote, don't you touch my sister. I feel like she's channeling her inner Asriel here. And I am here for it. Like when he says, you know, like, be careful how you speak about my high lady. You know, yes. I remember reading this for the first time and shooting up out of my seat. I, there was it was a no fucking way moment. Like there was a lot in this book that just didn't really shock me to the level of like Amron throwing Bob away. But this was the moment of like, oh, Sarah J. Mass got me. <laughs> like, this was good. You know, it's so funny because I know that we keep joking about this being an Arya Stark moment, but it really is. <laughs> well, and like, spoilers for season eight of Game of Thrones, but honestly, it's been out for long enough. I feel like it's fair game. But like that moment where Arya comes out of the dark and just like, tune to the Night King, like, that is exactly what I imagine Elaine doing here. Oh, definitely. But it's so funny because Elaine and Arya are not the same type of character, at least as of right now. Because this feels like such an out of left field moment, really. If you've been reading Elaine at more of like a surface level, like to be quite honest, like I had been every single reread of this series prior to this deep dive. But now that I've read this book in a deep dive manner, this plot twist, I'll call it, feels so fucking right for Elaine. From book two, she has always been ready to spring into action, at least in the Elaine way that she does. She has been told her entire life that she's like, just kind of sit still, look pretty. Like other people will take care of you and protect you. And while she's kind of had learned helplessness from that, and that's, I'm not, that's not a dig at her. It's just how it's been. But I, 
love this moment for her because it's really embodying her. No, I am actually someone who does take the knife and plunge it into the King of Highburn's neck. And I mean, like, for example, like she's protected and stood up for the human lands when Nesta did not want to like heed Favor's request in back in Akamath. She also offered up her ex-fiance's estate, which, you know, is deadly to her own kind. Now, she had other motives there, but we're not going to discuss that at this moment. She helped kick the Naga Hound off of Asriel last episode and helped save the child of the Blessed. She, like, did she have moments where she fell into a shell of herself? Of course. But so did Feyre and so will Nesta. So it's not to negate her bravery here. This is such a moment where it's like, wow, Elaine is really coming into her own here. It is just, I keep on saying this. I think I say this every freaking episode, but I just can't wait for Elaine in future books because while she does seem very soft and, you know, demure, very oh, mindful, <laughs> me, I still don't know what it means. I still don't get that trend, but it's fine. That doesn't mean that Elaine can't have her own version of, I'll call it like the firebird within her, basically. Last we saw Elaine during this battle, she was vomiting from pure terror. It's why Feyre realized she couldn't join her and Amran to get across the battlefield to the cauldron. And while I think she drew upon this inner strength you're talking about here, Nicole, I also have to wonder... Did the cauldron help guide Elaine here? Or even like I was saying earlier with Truth Teller giving her an extra nudge to get to this pinnacle moment. Right as the king readies himself to slay Cassian and Nesta, Feyre pleads with the cauldron to save them. <gasps> Quote, for a moment, I thought the cauldron had answered my pleas. I know that this all happens too fast that Elaine would already be on her way to this clearing to help her sister and Cassian. But it also makes you wonder if the cauldron did indeed answer Feyre's pleads via its connection with Elaine. Oh my God, that's so good. Well, not even to diminish, like, that's not here to say like, oh, Elaine didn't actually do it. It was really the cauldron. Exactly. Like, oh, it's absolutely not. Saying not that yeah. Like, it's, I, oh my God, I love that where it's actually this extra magical element at play. And I know you're, you love your fate bullshit here. Like, yes. that's very like along with the fate bullshit. Like. Oh my God, that's, I just got chills. That's so good. Yes, yes. So speaking of the cauldron, as the King of Highburn slumps to his knees, clawing at the knife jutting out of his throat, the cauldron purrs in Elaine's presence. And I'm so sorry. I cannot roll my R's like a whole can. <laughs> there, thank you. <laughs> and my question is, does it purr in happiness to see Elaine? <gasps> or is it also purring in happiness that the king is going down? Yes. <laughs> Which so let's you know let's talk about the finale of this scene and I am going to be jumping a little bit into chapter 75 for this because to be honest it's just a few pages and we need to wrap the scene up here. Quote, Nesta wrapped her hand around Truth Teller's obsidian hilt and slowly as if savoring every bit of effort it took, Nesta began to twist the blade. And as she severs his head, she smiles a little as if she's remembering that death promise she made to the king back in Highburn at the end of Akamath. What a full circle moment. Nesta actually kills the King of Highburn. Can we get one more huzzah, huzzah, huzzah? I have a quick side note about this because everyone gives Nesta credit for slaying the King of Highburn. And while that is true, she does sever his head and lift it up like a motherfucking trophy. Why does Elaine never get any freaking credit? Because she... She does. She Multiple people do give her credit. It happens like Elaine. twice more. And she'll even say, well, I just stabbed him. What an Elaine. <laughs> what an Elaine. <laughs> Elaine. I think that goes back to like, she doesn't want the credit. The, you know, Nesta Girl. doesn't bask in the glory by any means. Like, neither of them want this glory that goes along with killing the King of Highburn. It was a sisterly joint effort. And, I just, you know, we know how that goes. That is that very... Was, I just always feel like Nesta is the one who's in the glory around it. So maybe I've been reading it again. I that you're this is in future books that I have we haven't deep dived yet. So maybe yeah. I haven't looked at it through my new perspective around <laughs> Elaine, if you will. So you know, I'll hold my tongue and come back to that. <laughs> okay, so back to the scene because wow, does it hold a lot of weight? Nesta is an unyielding person who can hold a grudge like no other, who is fiercely loyal to her few loved ones and has impregnable walls around her 99% of the time. Like I said, it feels so fitting that she is the one to take down the King of Highburn, an ancient and powerful fae who considered her a major thorn in his side since he forced her to become fae. He created his own worst enemy. By personally going after Nesta, he sealed his fate because when she wants you dead, 
you're dead, which may also allude to her powers, not in a literal sense, but you know, like her power of death. As she went into the cauldron, a death promise was on her mind, which makes me wonder if that's why she took the power of death within the cauldron when she was made, almost like she drew it to her in that moment of ensuring the king will die for what he had done to her and Elaine. Again, it's not the actual power that killed the king, but it is that fiery power within her Self. There has been so much foreshadowing all of this book and, of course, at the end of Akamath leading up to this moment. Even though Nesta is untrained, with the help of her sister's surprise attack, the archer on sisters who originally didn't want anything to do with the Fae or this war took down the King of Hybern. Going back to what I was saying a little while ago about how the fandom is frustrated by the stark change in Nesta and Cassian after the book, we have to understand the life altering impact this whole scene has on Nesta. In Frost and Starlight, Chapter 21, Cassian reflects on it all. Quote, she made it clear enough in those initial days after that last battle that she wanted nothing to do with him, with any of them. He understood. He really did. It taken him months, years after his first battles to readjust, to cope. And then we'll talk about it next episode too. Even at the end of Akawar, she really does start withdrawing from everyone else. This person we're seeing in Nesta right now in this moment will seem gone as she drowns herself in drinking and casual sex, slipping further into self-loathing and depression as her way of coping. She'll feel responsible for her father's death, like Nicole was talking about earlier, and she'll shove down all of her complex feelings regarding her hatred for him. She won't feel worthy of love or true companionship like this with Cassian. So she will drive him away at any opportunity to protect herself from having to face her own inner demons. Will it seem like an extreme 180 from her character character development in Akawar? Yes. And the big shift will happen after the most traumatic event of her life. Life is not linear, friends. We have our ups and downs and Nesta will hit rock bottom after this because of this event and all of her complicated feelings around it and her complicated feelings for herself. It's her unhealthy way of coping with the trauma, the negative perspective of herself, the tangled emotions that she cannot fathom facing head on. So instead, she'll push it all down and feel nothing because if she feels anything, she'll feel everything. Last thing to wrap up this section, the cauldron recognizes that Elaine, who it gifted with such powers, is defending this, quote, thief, Nesta. Quote, it would not harm Elaine, even in its hunt to reclaim what had been taken. Remember that the whole reason Thera was present for this scene was because the cauldron tracked down Nesta and her power, and it probably wanted to take its power back somehow, some way. But when it saw Elaine defend this thief that it was hunting, it retreats and chooses not to continue its mission of retaking its power from Nesta. In a way, the cauldron lets Nesta off the hook because of its love for Elaine. And with that, the cauldron and Thera whip back across the battlefield, the fighting still raging despite the king now being dead. And I love that Amarin's like, woman, woman, wake up, wake up, wake up, pull yourself together, together. So if you've been following us on Instagram stories, you will know that I've recently gotten back into running and oh my goodness, I'm just absolutely loving it. And part of my exercise routine includes extra hydration when I get home because oh my goodness, do I sweat. (laughs) Hydration, however, is not about just gulping down water. You also need plenty of electrolytes to replenish yourself. Enter Element. Element is an electrolyte solution that has enough sodium, potassium, and magnesium to get you feeling and performing your best. It has zero sugar, artificial flavors, or other dodgy ingredients that hold you back, yet it still packs in the flavor. I absolutely love how many flavors there are to choose from with Element. A few of my favorites are watermelon salt, raspberry salt, orange salt, and mango chili. But seriously, I could list all of them as my favorites. They're so delicious. In fact, I'm right now drinking my citrus salt right here. (laughs) (laughs) Element has come up with a fantastic offer for our listeners. Get your free sample pack with any Element purchase at drinkelement.com dot com slash ffg that's drink lmnt dot com slash ffg be sure also to try the new element sparkling a bold 16 ounce can of sparkling electrolyte water that is perfect for on the go black cherry is amazing by the way (laughs) (laughs) all right so let's turn our full attention to foreshadowing important moments that you know we haven't already mentioned in the little left of this book and of course the rest of the series 
Faber says that she will never show Reese the Ouroboros version of herself. While she will never show him the experience she had while looking in the Ouroboros mirror, she will paint this version of herself and give it to him as a winter solstice present in Frost and Starlight. It's so funny. I can just imagine being like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> like he hangs it up in his study and it's like, good God! <laughs> like also, Nesta's eyes when she unleashes on the King of Highburn, it is our first sign of silver fire. Yes, and then even before the king arrives, as she and Cassian prepare for his arrival, there's that description of, quote, Nesta's eyes blazing with that inner unholy fire. I wonder if she activated her silver flame's power after she unleashed her power from the cauldron to get the king's attention? Sure. Maybe? Sure. I don't know. Feyre notices that Cassian and Nesta will go together. Obviously, this is so much mates, 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 mates foreshadowing. But this is also foreshadowing for another mated pair that will make this exact bargain etched on their skin even very, very soon, which I have some feelings about. I have a feeling I'm going to be defending it in a way that you will not be. But anyway. Which is, like, I am a romantic. I am the romantic of this podcast. I love the romance and the, oh, yes. That's just stupid. That is just a Oh, it's stupid politically bargain. stupid. But from a storytelling perspective, I totally get it. Sure. <laughs> it is time to sip some tea with the cereal. Every episode, Lexi is going to sit down with the cereal, who is now RIP, and walk us through a world building topic to help us better understand this world and the people in it. Today's cereal topic is the timeline of Miriam and Draken. I know we've talked about them every time there's an info download in the books, which happens surprisingly often. But today we are laying it all out in one explanation because, hey, our friends have finally made it on the page and it's really, really exciting to finally meet them. Or at least Draken. We'll meet Miriam next episode approximately, emphasis on this approximately, 520 years ago when mortals were still enslaved by the Fae, Miriam was born in the southern part of the continent. She was half human, half Fae. Sadly, she was conceived against her human mother's will by her high Fae father. And because she was born in the cruelest Fae territory, the Black Land, Miriam was doomed to a life of slavery like all other humans and half humans. Meanwhile, the terrible and cruel queen of the Black Land got engaged to a a foreign fae prince named Draken. He was of the seraphim winged species of fairies who have white feathered wings and particularly strong magic that wields wind. This queen of the Blackland gave her slave Miriam to Draken as an engagement gift. Draken was horrified having not realized how sadistic this queen was when he agreed to marry her. So he helped Miriam escape and he broke off his engagement to the queen of the Blackland. Miriam fled the Blackland and soon enough found Jurian's human rebels prepared preparing for the war. However, she vowed to someday return to her homeland and free her fellow slaves. Soon enough, the war started. Miriam worked as a healer in Durian's army, and over time, they became lovers. Miriam also became friends with members of the Night Court's inner circle, specifically Moore, who was fighting on the continent at the time and was, of course, an ally with the humans. Separately, Prince Draken had also allied his Seraphim people with the humans during this war, including Durian and his army. Little did Miriam know, Prince Draken had been looking for her after he helped her escape three years ago before the war started. So all of this has happened now within the last three years. As fate would have it, Draken got injured during a battle and Miriam ended up being the healer who tended to him. I should note that while Miriam and Draken were reunited as healer and patient, this is allegedly not when they became a couple. She was still with Jurian and presumably did not act on anything, but Draken was falling for her. So the war continued. As we know, it lasted seven years and we're already about three years into it. So here's what happened over the next four years of the war. Durian began a relationship with Clithia, who was on the enemy's side. Remember, she was Amarantha's sister and Amarantha was one of Highburn's top commanders. But... This relationship from Jurian's end was a ruse. He was actually still with Miriam and was only pretending to be in love with Clithia to get information on the enemy. Indeed, according to Jurian, Miriam supported this affair and even encouraged it. 
Clithia was madly in love with Durian and had a blind eye to his trickery. However, Durian began changing during his affair with Clithia and not for the better. Miriam didn't like who Durian was becoming and because of this, eventually ended her relationship with him while he was still pretending to be with Clithia. Within the last year of the war, Miriam and Draken reconnected and fell in love. Turns out, they're mates! They made it and married on the same night that Durian betrayed Clithia and brutally killed her. It's never stated if Miriam and Draken being together is what led Durian to snap with Clithia finally, but I imagine it had an influence. Shortly afterward, Amarantha somehow captured Miriam to set a trap for Draken and his powerful legion. Rhysand sent his force in to rescue Miriam, and while she was successfully freed, Rhys and his surviving legion were captured and tortured. In an effort to get Rhys to talk and share information on their side, Amarantha ended up tormenting and killing almost all of his soldiers. While imprisoned by Amarantha, Rhys witnessed her and Durian go head to head in combat. What was Durian doing there? I'm not sure, but I bet it has something to do with Miriam being captured. Maybe. Anyway, yeah. Amarantha fiercely hated Durian and all humans for killing her sister. When she bested him, she tortured him for the next few weeks, much to Hyburn's frustration because she was too consumed with revenge against Durian to go to Hyburn's aid in the war when needed most. Until Reese's father and his forces came to the rescue, Amarantha heavy quotes, killed Durian and fled. But back to Miriam and Draken. Timestamp is near the end of the war. They were mated and married. She was free of Amarantha. Her ex-boyfriend was out of the picture. Now it's time to, right, I feel bad saying that, but it's true. Now it's time to uphold her promise to free the slaves from the Blackland. Miriam, Draken, his legions, and more marched into the Blackland. We don't know how, but they succeeded in freeing 50,000 humans from the territory and ventured through the desert to the Erythian Sea, where they had ships waiting to bring everyone to another kingdom. But the queen of the Black Land wasn't going to let them get away with it so easily. She had all the ships burned before the freed humans and Seraphim Legion could reach them, and her army was fast on their trail. Draken's forces used their magic to part the sea and allow the humans to run to safety while Draken and his soldiers fought the Black Land army. Miriam refused to flee until all of her people had reached safety. As a result of staying back, she got skewered by a spear thrown by the queen of the Black Land herself. Her friend Nefel a seraphim cartographer with small wings and unfit to be a warrior realized that Miriam was not among everyone else getting to safety through the parted sea. So just as the ocean started coming crashing down and against all odds, Nefel managed to carry Miriam and flew through the narrow pathway. Unfortunately, though, Miriam still bled out from her wound and died. But Draken knew of a sacred island where a powerful object made by the cauldron had been hidden. And no, we don't know any more about this powerful object at this time. He used that object to resurrect her, granting Miriam a phase long life in the process while still keeping her half fae, half human body. On this island of Cretea, Draken's seraphim fae and Miriam's human people settled, proving that these two people can live in harmony and peace together. And that, more than anything, is what Draken and Miriam represent in our story. That it is possible for fae and humans to live together without a treaty, without a wall. 300 years ago, so 200 years after they settled after the war, there was some trouble on the Cretea borders that led Draken and Miriam to set up a glamour to keep the island shielded. This shield made it so that anyone who approached would only see a ruin and be inclined to turn around. Miriam got this idea from Reese and the wards on Valaris. Turns out this glamour worked a little too well, so that while yes, it successfully kept enemies away and they stayed well hidden, it also prevented friends from contacting or finding them. Once they heard about the oncoming war with Hybern and Jurian hunting down Miriam, they came to Prithian's aid. On the way, they met up with Parpa Archeron and Vasa's Armadas, and using the Seraphim wind magic, they gave all the ships an extra push to arrive just in time for the final battle. After the war is won, jumping ahead here just a little bit, they will secretly smuggle the cauldron back to Cretea with them to prevent inner court arguing over the cauldron and where it should be. But we'll get to that next episode. And that, friends, is our serial tea time on Miriam and Draken. And last but not least, let's wrap up our Akatar only part of this episode with our Faye Vrit moments. We have very few. Faye, it's not nothing against this episode. We just talked about a lot of them in the in the deep dive part. I also realize like when I'm so focused in on some of these like, you know, like more battle focused episodes, like I kind of forget to pull out other favorite moments. <laughs> well, the favorite 
moments are like, and then whoosh, and you pew pew. <laughs> like, <laughs> so Feyre mentioning how she's gotten all of the dogs and horses off of their estate during this massive winnow sesh. So I guess there's just horses chilling at the summer court now, which I don't know why that brings me so much joy. I assume that there were horses beforehand because we know that there were horses in the spring court. That's true. I don't know. I just love the idea of like little human horses chilling with fey horses becoming buddies. (laughs) Like I just Oh, do you think there are fey horses? I would imagine so. Maybe? Oh, I just I never thought about I just kind of a picture that the horses in the Prithian were different from the horses in the human lands. Maybe not. I didn't get that idea but we have the pegasus i'm just all about the pegasuses <laughs> like <laughs> maybe they'll breed with the pegasuses and then they'll have half horse half pegasus babies i want this short story, <laughs> maybe. Short story. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> can you tell we haven't recorded an episode in like two and a half weeks <laughs> oh my god and last but not least amarin's leathers being so small that they were made for a child and reese being like don't tell her <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's just amazing all right friends we're about to begin our mass verse madness section of the episode Today's Mass vs. Madness includes spoilers for the Crescent City series, so if you have not read all three Crescent City books, this is where we part ways. But before you go, reminder that next episode, we will be covering Akawar chapters 75 through 82, aka the final Akawar episode. I can't believe like those 11 weeks flew. Oh my God. We want to give the biggest shout out of appreciation to our newest Inner Circle Patreon members. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts for being part of the Inner Circle. You all are absolutely amazing. We love you. All right. The biggest shout out to Harshini, Miranda, Wendy, Amanda, Sam, Blair, Rachel, and Leslie. Thank you all so much for being part of the Inner Circle. We appreciate you from the bottom of our hearts. And if you're like, wait a second, I want my name read off on a Fantasy Fan Girls podcast episode too, be sure to join the Patreon party at patreon.com slash fantasy fangirls. We also have Fantasy Fangirls merch out the wazoo. And especially as it gets to be fall, we have some epic crew necks. I need to get the I like my books like I like my podcast spicy shirt crew neck. I really need it. But you can find the link to our merch store in the show notes. And of course, if you're not following us on TikTok and Instagram, you're really missing out, friends. Give us a follow at Fantasy Fangirls Pod. Also, please do not forget to rate and review the podcast. It takes two seconds to hit that five star button to write a little love note in the review section. We have 13,000 star five star reviews on this show. Like that is y'all that is unheard of on a podcast. That's insane. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to everyone who has hit that five star button. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to everyone who's written a little love note. If you haven't done it yet, it is so helpful, not only for our show, but for any of the podcasts that you listen to. All right. We are now entering our Mass vs. Madness segment of the episode where we call out series crossover references and discuss theories. Today, we are discussing concepts that give spoilers from Crescent City 3, House of Flame and Shadow. So (laughs) please only continue listening if you've read the Crescent City series. We have to talk about Truth Teller and its prominence in House of Flame and Shadow. I'm going to get on my high horse for two oh, seconds geez. and then you're going to actually like be, you know, intelligent, and like give actual information. I just need <laughs> to be mad for four seconds. In chapter 69 of Akawar, Asriel said, it never failed me once. Quote, he gently took her hand and pressed the hilt of the legendary blade into it. It will serve you well. True. And you know who else it served well? Bryce fucking Quinlan, who <laughs> stole his emotional support dagger from him. I will never, ever get over the fact that she took his emotional support dagger and then yeeted out of Prithian. Does it make sense for her and her story? And she has no loyalty. It's that's sure. World. It does. It, whatever does, I'm still irrationally mad. Like, I'm still so mad. Especially oh, the like- fact that he's never given it to anyone. And Elaine was the first person. And then someone stole it from him. Anyway, be- and then she gave it back. She did. Still, anyway, <laughs> Truth Teller's twin is the Star Sword, which is a sword Bryce carries and is originally from this Akatar world, known as Gwydian King Fion's sword. These two weapons are drawn to each other, and when close, they sing to one another. Truth Teller also glows a dark light in response to the sword's white light. In Midgard, there is a Fey prophecy which says, quote, when knife and sword are reunited, so shall our people be, aka Truth Teller and the Star Sword. 
sword. I understand two meanings to this prophecy. One, and I'll say the main one here, is that the Fey people of Perithian have been separated for 15,000 years, and so have these two weapons. The Fey's original homeland is where Akatar takes place, and that's where Truth Teller has been all this time. And then Thea went with some of their people to Midgard, taking the Star Sword with her. Well, actually, Truth Teller originally went to Midgard too, but then it went back with Selene. Anyway, so when the knife and sword are literally reunited, so are the Fey people of Perithian and Midgard. The second meaning is when these weapons are united, they can open a portal to nowhere. How? Because the sword is made and the knife is able to unmake things. I don't know exactly what that entails, but anyway. In other words, made and unmade, matter and antimatter. Thanks to the sword and knife being reunited, Bryce is able to destroy the Asteri and send them to this place of no existence. By defeating the Asteri, the Fey of Midgard are free from their tyrants and able to unite in a way they never have been able to before. When Bryce transported through realms to the Fey homeland, her star sword guided her to its twin so that they could be reunited. And that is how and why she ended up in Valaris near Asriel with his truth teller. But how did Asriel end up with truth teller in the first place? We don't know yet, but the dagger originally belonged to King Theon's dear friend, Anelius. When Anelius died during the war against the Daglin, King Theon took Truth Teller and began carrying it until he died and Thea took it. Once in Midgard, Thea sent her daughter Selene back to their homeworld with the harp and the dagger. Since Selene married the High Lord of the Night Court and had children with him, we can assume Truth Teller was passed down through the generations of the High Lord of the Night Court, which makes me inclined to think Reese gave Truth Teller to Asriel or his father gave it to him as a symbol of giving the dagger back to the ruler's right-hand man and dear friend. Asriel is indeed familiar with Anelius's name because when the Asteri Vesperus says to him, quote, did Fion send you then to slay me in my sleep or was it that traitor Anelius? I see that you bear his dagger as his emissary or his assassin. Following that statement, quote, the words must have meant something to Azrael. The warrior let out a small noise of shock, which, yes, Azrael is absolutely familiar with the name Anelius. Now, did he know that this dagger had previously been Anelius's? We don't know. That might have actually been that moment of truth for him. But Anelius was the very first Illyrian warrior. The pass of Anelius that Nesta guards in Silver Flames that was the pass of Anelius. He was the very first Illyrian warrior, and the rite is in honor of him. We will talk about that so much more in Silver Flames, but there is a huge parallel there. One more thing about Truth Teller. During Selene's mega download in House of Flame and Shadow, she says about these two weapons, quote, as she had helped made them, they answered to the call in her blood, to her very power. This is Selene talking about her mother, Thea. Building on my previous theory that the Archeron sisters are distantly related to Thea, this means that Elaine's ancestor wielded Truth Teller and answered to the call in her blood. One more reason why Elaine could be fated to wield Truth Teller in such an impactful way. That I don't know why I'm so convinced that the Archeron sisters are descendants of Thea. Like it's well, all making too much sense. It, it makes too much sense. That's why. Like it makes. So, <laughs> oh my god, that's so good. One other mass first madness thing that I have to pull in is. Is that the Seraphim, aka Draken's Legion and Draken's people, are the Akatar equivalent of the angels and aka the Malachim from Crescent City. I also want to point out that in Akatar they have wind power, which I believe both Isaiah and Micah have in I obviously Micah's is like on another freaking level because he's an archangel, but definitely Isaiah has in Crescent City. So they're absolutely the same breed yes. i'll call it sure and, and i know that we said that this is crescent city spoilers only but i just kind of want to wrap up our conversation about striga and daglin and stuff like that so spoilers for throne of glass here what i think is that striga and i suppose the bone carver too they are volg i know that there's like that theory that the volg are the asteri and of course they're the daglin too but i'm under the impression that there are different levels of volg right like yeah. we, we already well, know yeah. that and I think that the Vogue might be almost like an earlier version of the Asteri and the Daglin. And so I think that Striga might be like, I say Vogue Queen, but it's not quite to the same level of the all-powerful Asteri and Daglin. So it's kind of like the Vogue Queen is like a few steps below 
the Daglin. I this is all just me in my own head here, but that's what I think though. So I think she might not be Daglin and Asteri like that level, but she is just a level down as a Vault Queen. I'm down for both options. Am I still going to point out every single instance that, that the Daglin are the Asteri and the Volg absolutely yes. Yes, yeah. and, and I do think that the Volg are absolutely connected and like oh yeah, like I said, like a lesser version of the Asteri, almost like a less evolved version of the Asteri. Yes, no Volg queen would be able to get killed with her neck getting snapped. You know, or that's yeah. true. That is so true. I so that's why it's like I just don't think that she can be that powerful ultimately because unless it's just way too convenient of a plot I, point. That's what I'm leaning to towards. Unfortunately, I think I am leaning towards it just being way too convenient of a plot. Anyway, we <laughs> could debate this until we're blue in the face. <laughs> All right, friends. It is officially the end of this episode. Next episode, like we mentioned, it is going to be our Aqua War finale covering chapters 75 through 82. Thank you, as always, to our executive producer, Hayden, a.k.a. our sanity manager. We freaking love ya. And last but not least, share this episode with your fellow Akatar friends. If you are like, you know what, Papa Archeron, you were useful for 15 seconds and your friend is like, I don't know. You can send this episode to try to convince them how that 15 seconds of usefulness was on the page. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, everybody. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Fun fact, Brett and I wrote this when we were in an airport in Milan and we wrote it together when we were so sleep deprived and it was <laughs> one of the funnest intercircle debriefs I've ever written. Whisk, whisk, whisk. whisk. Irish wristwatch. <laughs> I guess she wouldn't like our athleisure. I guess she wouldn't like our athleisure. 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 <laughs> Things. Venons. <laughs> <laughs> Storytelling that keeps you on the seat of your pants. Is that the right thing? Nope. <laughs> the edge of your seat. <laughs> you may boy. Oh, dear. You, <laughs> you may boy is king. <laughs>